Hey everybody, I'm in downtown Franklin getting ready to head into the office to wrap up DJ Shipley's episode for the Sean Ryan Show. With that being said, it's becoming increasingly more challenging to reach our audience. So if you don't mind helping us out, please hit that like button, leave a comment, hit the bell, and turn notifications to all. And that's not just this channel. That's everybody's channel that you like. All right, love you guys. Hope you enjoy the show, and thank you. And uh, one more thing. Happy Thanksgiving. War's not fair. I think that was a lesson learned out of that. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't get the, the chance to fight, the chance to show how good you are, doesn't matter. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show, and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite mindset. Also on tier two you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events, to who's coming on the show, I take suggestions, and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated, and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. First deployment in the SEAL teams, you get in, biggest loss in SEAL team history happens. Then you get through green team and right after you graduate, what, maybe six, less than a year afterwards. Yeah, I mean, August of, uh, August of 11. Extortion 17 happens, which again is the biggest loss in SEAL team history. I remember looking over and seeing um, Jay and I remember him sitting upright, and I watched him get shot one more time, um, right in the face. And it looked like that was it. He hit the ground so hard, you knew he was dead. So the way it was, it's the front door, and there's a long-ass hallway going down, and there's a dude who's in a sandbag position with a belt fed at the end of the hallway. And it's just chewing down the hallway. Boom, spins him around and dumps him. He gets back up grabs him and gets shot again. So hold on. Did you eliminate the threat? Yep. He's dead. Mm -hmm. Did he, he didn't hit you. He did. He did hit you. He hit me in the, in the chest plate. I unloaded on him, got off three rounds and a bolt lock. I think he took a double stack to the elbow so it blew out his entire arm and then he took one to the face that basically removed his jaw, removed his nose, um, and you could look inside him. You could hear that dude, the impacts. You'd hear him smack. Um, you could hear him screaming. 
and it was very satisfying. And as we go to divide, this dude opens up on the front door and lets it go and just you just see splinters of wood and just fucking traces us. It's not reality until it's reality. That's not gonna happen. Yes, it is. Whether you want it to or not, it's happening right now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I wanna start by giving everybody a couple of updates on what we have going on here at Vigilance Elite. And I wanna start off by saying thank you to everybody that left us an iTunes review. Guys, The Sean Ryan Show now has 10,000 iTunes reviews in only 14 episodes. That is unheard of. So if you haven't left us a review yet, please head over to iTunes. There's a link down in the description. Just leave us one word if you're short on time and help us get to 20,000 reviews. I would really appreciate it. Moving on to our patrons, our subscription network where we put behind the scenes content. Guys, it is patrons like you that make all of these one of a kind stories from these gentlemen that are on this show possible. These stories, most of these stories have never been told before, and it really is your support that allows all of these productions to happen. So thank you very much. Moving on, we are now getting into the YouTube short game. So we have all these different artifacts. A lot of them are from guests on the show. Maybe you've seen some of them in the background of the show. And we are now doing a studio tour of each and every piece on YouTube Shorts. You can click the link right there and it'll show you the YouTube Short, the first one. So we'll be doing that. All right, let's get on with it. Ladies and gentlemen, and now what you've all been waiting for, my next guest. He is a former Navy SEAL and a former development group, also known as SEAL Team 6 Operator. He's got the better part of 17 years of operational experience. He's also the founder of Tribe Skates, which is a skateboard company that employs only Gold Star family members. If you don't know what a Gold Star family member is, it's basically a family member who has lost an immediate family member in war. That's who he employs, which is very solid work. He's also the founder of GBRS Group, which is the premier training group in the United States and most up to date at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my next guest, Mr. DJ Shipley. DJ Shipley, welcome to the show, man. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's an honor. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. We've been wanting to get one of you guys over here for a while, and uh, and you know, finally it happened. So, but just a quick snapshot of your career before we get started. Seventeen years in the military, most of pretty much all of which is in naval special warfare. Went through, but straight into the SEAL teams, and then over to Dev Group. So uh, medically retired. Now you are the owner of two successful companies, one being Tribe Skates, uh, where you employ all, everyone employed there is a Gold Star yep. family member, correct? Correct. And you guys make skateboards, apparel. Uh, you gave me one of those boards. <laughs> it looks really awesome. Uh, it's going to look great here in the studio. And then the other company uh, you co-own with your best friend and former teammate, Cole Fackler, uh, GBRS Group, which uh, in my opinion is probably the most relevant premier exclusive training group in the country right now. I mean, you guys are definitely the most relevant and uh, up to speed, fresh out and uh, from tier one unit. So that means a lot. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't checked out GBRS Group, check them out. Uh, So who do you 
when you guys are hiring, are you only hiring SEALs? Are you only hiring Tier 1? or Tier 1. We've got a couple Air Force guys we've yeah. worked with. A um, couple guys from the Army side. Call in and bring some favors and some uh, some niche stuff. they got a couple long-range guys that we pull in when we need to. And Now we have a full-time uh, recce guy for Chris. So, you know, CQB is the bread and butter, but I'm not afraid to branch out. But, yeah, it's got to be the Tier 1 resume. Cool. What are you guys teaching? Are you teaching... Well, last night at dinner, we were kind of talking about it. It was private lessons, it sounds like, groups, all the way up to SWAT. Yeah, I mean, we do everything. Um, military, local law enforcement, um, got a couple of government contracts, stuff like that. And then the civilian market. The open enrollment stuff scared us. It did, um, after the Chris Kyle thing, especially. Yeah. Um, a lot of people on the yard line, a lot of people brand new to guns, a lot of people that really want to shoot somebody really want to become famous and there was no real good way to vet them unless you do private. So we do phone calls, talk to them for an hour and then we Google search the shit out of them. You got to do a little bit of vetting yeah. and set up a call with those guys. And if they have five or six friends of all equal skill set or the same in state, then we'll set up a, set up a training event. We'll drive down there. We'll fly in, bring them up to us and kind of do everything. Cool. And you guys are based out of uh, Virginia beach. Yeah. We've got a gym there. We've got, Kitchen, showers, kill house, got everything. What, no shit. Yeah. Damn. How long have you been doing that? <sighs> Almost two years now. Two years? Yep. Yeah, we started that in 19. Damn. Well, it looks like it's uh, online looking in, you know, from the outside. It looks like it's exploding. So, yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. I appreciate it. But, uh, well, before we get started, I always give everybody a gift. <laughs> There you go. Oh, Jesus. There we go. Merry Christmas. Somebody must have told you. Dude. I mean, you talked to Pat. Did she tell you how much I ate this shit? What's that? Did she tell you how much I ate candy I ate? <laughs> Dude, I do, man. I have a sweet tooth, bro. Thank you. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we pleasure. talked about the gummy bear stuff last night. I love it. Um, yeah, so before we get started, uh, I have a subscription account and, uh, as much as I'd love to tell everybody that gummy bears finances, everything that's going on here, uh, really it's my patrons on Patreon, uh, that support the show. That's how you're able to sit here, how I'm here, how all this was built. And, uh, so one of the things I do for them, uh, is I tell them who's coming on before they get here. Cool. And uh, I let them, you know, comment and a uh, bunch of questions, and then I pick one uh, to ask. So this is from Will on Patreon <clears throat> uh, to you. He says, I know his company does a lot for Gold Star families, and I'm sure he's experienced his fair share of losing friends, either through physical or mental combat. Would he be willing to give any advice on how he deals with these feelings? That's the first one? <laughs> that's 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 oh. the only one I'm going to give you. It's no softballs. Okay. How I deal with it personally? Yeah. We get a lot of questions on how to deal with loss. And uh, I've done some videos on it. And, and it's just everybody's always curious, you know, how guys like me or you and, and uh, our colleagues deal with that. Get through it. You know, each one's different. Um, for me, for the longest time, I just ignored and override. I just compartmentalized everything. Didn't happen to me. It's not me. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, it's easier just to uh, not accept it to be reality. When you do a dangerous job long enough, it'll eventually get you. Yeah. Unless you're fortunate enough to retire. Um, you can't let it, can't let that be... Your defining moment, almost like you're waiting for it to happen. The gold star thing happens, you do a dangerous job. Firemen, police, military, doesn't matter. We all have our gold star community, um, people that die in the line of service. Um, and for me, it's a, it's a show of their loyalty. Like, you wanna see how far they'll go, they just showed you. They just yeah. went the whole way. Like, what an honor to be part of that organization where people will give up their lives for people they've never even met. That's how I process now. 
when I see it and I see the families, it hurts. It sucks. Yeah. There's so many dudes I miss. You know, you're at Harris Teeter buying groceries and I look over and there's a whole family. Damn. Yeah. The two platoons with their husband. What are you gonna say? Yeah. Go and give him a hug and pretend like it's okay. It's not okay. But they did exactly what they wanted to do. Yep. At that moment, like he was right where he wanted to be, surrounded with the best people on earth, dudes he loved, um, dudes he would have gladly died for, and they got the opportunity to show how committed they were to the cause. So I honor their sacrifice now. It took me a long time to get there, but that's what I do now. I just honor them. Good for you, man. That's a great answer. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people experience loss, and one thing I always tell them is, you know, you have to, you know, it's, it's good to mourn, but... Um, you got to think of how that person would want you to live, you know, and I don't think that anybody that I know, and I'm sure anybody that you know, wants you moping around for the rest of your life uh, because they died doing what they want to do. And uh, so it's, it's always good to keep that in mind. <clears throat> but, well, great answer. So let's get on with it. Um, so we're going to just start with childhood and go down a timeline of kind of uh, your all the way up until now, but you've been surrounded by the SEAL teams your entire life. You're born into it. Your dad was a SEAL. Several family members of yours are SEALs, and then you wound up joining at a very young age. But let's just start right at the very beginning um, with some of the childhood stuff. What was it like, you know, growing up with your dad being an operational seal going on deployments all the time and uh and that's a that's a very high standard to live up to as a kid so let's start there so yeah um when my dad graduated buds i was my mom was six months pregnant so he checked on team one she gave birth to me and i essentially grew up in a platoon hut he was the only guy who had a kid at the time so Basically got raised by wolves, which was cool. Um, we transitioned, we moved over to the East Coast, um, like 89, like I was young, four. I don't remember anything. Started up uh, school, typical stuff, but he was gone the entire time. Um, so from the time we went to the East Coast, I forget what the rotations were back then. I mean, they were six, eight month appointments and he did eight of them back to back. So, I mean, he was gone. Yeah. Gone 200. 300 days out of the year. I mean, you remember the workup schedule. We've gone a lot. We grew up on a small farm, five acres, but God, man, we had everything. Chickens, ducks, geese, guinea hens, pheasants, quail, raised Chesapeake Bay retrievers, cows, horses, everything. Um, and I had to take care of it all. Slopping hogs at 5 a.m. Um, hot water heater blows out, pipes freeze, like the whole thing. And it's yeah. like, I remember doing that my entire life, just dealing with the farm life. And then he'd come back home, we'd go hunting, and it was like, now looking back on it's kind of surreal. Um, it was awesome. It was great. Like, your dad's Superman. Yeah. Like, how fucking cool is that? But back in the 90s, like, you remember, nobody knew what a Navy SEAL was. No one. So, like, my dad was in the Navy, your dad's in the Army. It doesn't really matter. Nobody gets it. As we started coming up, you know, Charlie Sheen, that whole thing, like people started to know, but nobody really knew. Um, there wasn't a war going on. It was, um, it was 80s and 90s, small little skirmishes, but um, losing people in combat wasn't a thing. We never had to live through it. It didn't happen. It'd be a training accident every now and then, and that was it. Um, so, yeah, kind of... Went through that whole thing, found my outlets, because um, I spent a lot of time alone. You know, me and my mom, had my sister growing up. And <sighs> Your sister older or younger? Younger. Younger. Five years. Um, so yeah, it was kind of just the three of us, living on that farm, making things happen. And he'd come back home and gear up for another deployment, and we kind of just picked up right where we left off. And, uh, but it was weird, like people who, uh, who aren't in the special operations community or don't know anybody like that, they think when your dad's uh, in the military, it's, I don't know, like Gunny Highway, like flat top haircuts and yes sir, no sir. Like, 
my dad treated me like I was a new guy. Really? Yeah, like we were we were best friends. We were like that's, that's who I wanted to be. Well, when did you? At what point did you know you wanted to become a team guy? Um, it was always just assumed. I mean, it was always said. Like we were always doing something. Like uh, when I'd have friends come over and stay the night, we wouldn't do typical things. We would do uh, we'd do a physical challenge. So we would run out. We'd pick up ten logs. We'd throw it over here. We'd run back ten push-ups do five pull-ups, run over here. We'd do like an O course, like a circuit. And if I didn't win, I better win. It was one of those things. Um, so it was always kind of assumed. And then when I hit skateboarding, um, that's all I wanted to do. I was addicted, man. I, I bought in hook, line, and sinker. I lived out in the middle of nowhere in Chesapeake, Virginia. And uh, we had a little cul-de-sac next door. Some older kids skating. I kind of got in that. And when he would leave on deployment, I'd have six months of no interruptions. I'd knock out chores and straight over there, and that's all I did all day. I obsessed. Damn. Um, started competing, and that's what I wanted to do. You started competing? Yeah. What, like the half pipe and shit? No, like I did street. Um, he built me a big vert ramp in the backyard, so we did the whole thing. Um, rode it all, but I really like street park. Um, and that was kind of the punishment. I'd get hurt. He'd be like, You broke your arm. They're not going to let you in the Navy. You can't be a SEAL. If you get a plate, and screws, they're not going to take you. You're going to ruin your entire life over riding a skateboard. No shit. So it really was just assumed you're going to oh, be yeah. a fucking team guy. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't know any better. I didn't care. Yeah. I mean, I remember, um, I think like middle school, I remember talking to my mom one day and I was like, would dad be upset if I became a veterinarian? Because I love animals. I do. I really like dogs. Like a kind of a weird obsession, but a healthy one. Um, I like dogs more than people and I wanted to be a vet. And um, it was kind of just pushed off, like, why would you want to be a vet when you can be a Navy SEAL? True. <laughs> there we went. So quickly dismissed. You can't be a professional skateboarder. You can't be a veterinarian. You can be a Navy SEAL. Um, some things kind of fell into place that uh, forced it to hand a little sooner than probably it should have. Yeah. You talk about uh, being addicted to the pressure to perform uh, during your childhood, and then, and then you kind of talk about it again uh, later on, and I think when you got to Dev Group. But what, what were you addicted to performing to when you were a kid? What pressure was it to your dad? Yeah, um, I mean, there's all kinds of pressure, but for me, I wanted praise. I had this long analogy I get into where I equate everybody to a certain type of dog. That dog's upbringing. Um, and I'm a Labrador. I am. I just want to people, please. Just bounce that tennis ball on the ground and let me go chase it. I'll do whatever you want to. Just pet me on the head at the end of the day. And that's all I wanted. I just wanted him to acknowledge me. That's all I wanted. It's like, I'm not good in school. Like, we go out and we hunt and I shoot everything. Like, I get a good boy doing that, but I didn't enjoy it. Mm. I didn't. I did it because it was a thing to do with him. I didn't care what we did. If that dude would have been a fly fisherman, I'd be fly fishing. Like, I didn't care. I just wanted to be next to him. But I didn't enjoy hunting. I didn't set him a deer stand. I didn't get it. Yeah. I mean, I shot him. Went duck hunting, snow goose hunting. I mean, I had a blast. But if you ask me what I wanted to do at 4.30 in the morning, it wasn't go shoot snow geese. Not back then. I wish he just would have wanted to do anything. So... Yeah. But the, yeah, the pressure to perform, um, everything became a competition. And then I just started competing at everything. Not good things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, doing young childhood stuff. But, um, yeah. So you joined, you joined at 17 years old. Yeah, I got into a little bit of trouble when I was 16. And, um, long story short, I had to go to court, and uh, the old man threw me at the mercy of the court. And said, um, Your Honor, he he can't be charged with this. You know, we have to get this off his record because he's gonna go to the Navy and he's gonna be a Navy SEAL. What was it? Um it was a an assault charge with a robbery. With a robbery? Mm-hmm. What were you it was a, it was what a, were you robbing? <laughs> me and uh, me and a bunch of my buddies got into a fight, and in the course of the fight, 
reached into uh, somebody's jacket and grabbed her phone and spiked it on the ground. And because of the dollar amount associated, because it was physical altercation, it became robbery and his parents wanted to press charges and make it a big deal. Um, at the end of the day, we bought him a cell phone and it got expunged off my record. Um, I mean, it came up years later, but yeah. I mean, so I had to get a waiver for that. I had to get an age waiver, underage possession of tobacco. So I had a bunch of waivers going in, um, which wasn't good. <laughs> um, didn't really help my case. And the judge looked at me and deal, community service and let me leave. And uh, I didn't realize at the time, but he had already gone to school uh, and talked to my guidance counselors, all my principals, and had signed me up for summer school. So that was my, uh, my sophomore year going into my junior year and it already signed me up. So the end of my junior year, I graduate or we finish that year in June and I basically do summer school until August and then I'm gone. Yeah. Already had me signed up for delayed entry program, everything. Like I was going to the Navy. Damn. Like there wasn't any doubt about it. Yeah. No SEAL contract, no A school. Nothing. Undesignated, send it. So how the hell did you get the buds on it if there was no contract? I passed a screen test at boot camp. That, that's it. I didn't realize how um, I didn't realize how dangerous a maneuver that was. Like my entire career, for the people that don't know, if you don't have a seal contract, I tell people, do not go to mess. Do not sign that contract because now they own you. Yeah. And they do. If I would have gotten sick, if um, if the whole class would have gotten the flu, and they just don't give you the screen test, I'm going to the fleet for four years. Like that's a long way to get back from. Yeah. Um, no A school, so if I didn't make it through BUDS, I was going to be a deck seaman, be a bosun's mate. I didn't get in I already had a trident. I didn't have a rating. Damn. Yeah. So, uh, just for the audience, that they don't know what the hell an A school is. An A school, basically, um, I kind of describe it as it's almost a marketing play of the teams. Like, they need SEALs, but so many people quit that what they do is they find all the jobs in the Navy that have a shortage. Most of them are the ones you have to be either really intelligent to get into or the complete shit jobs. And uh, it's kind of a mixed bag of nuts there. You pick one, you go through this, the training, you go to BUDS, uh, whatever, 80, 85% people quit, and then they fill those job descriptions. So so you didn't have any A school. You went right into you went right from boot camp to BUDS. So were you 17 when you got to BUDS? Mm -hmm. No shit. Yeah, he... Um... He was getting ready to retire, so the way we did it is he retired, I think on the same day that I became active, we did a one-for-one -one swap. We had the exact same name, he's a junior, I'm the third, and we just swapped him. So he pulled strings, um, I graduated boot camp, I came back to Little Creek, I was a white shirt, a little scruff rollback waiting for my buds class. Damn. Did that for three months and flew out to California with a sea bag and sent it. I didn't have a car, I didn't have a driver's license the entire time I was back, I didn't have anything. Like I didn't, I didn't know anything. Like my senior year, I was in buds. I knew yeah. nothing. I didn't know anything. I didn't have a cell phone. I had nothing. I just sent it. So you grew up in the teams. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, you take me on training trips. It was a blast. I got the AP Hill for the demo courses and a bunch of the guys I worked with later in the teams. I remember them when they were new guys. And they remember me. Damn, that's crazy. Being out there taking a skateboard out of AP Hill and doing kickflips over cases of beer for the guys. And yeah, man. <laughs> oh, dude. Like, we did the whole thing. I was like, my childhood was fucking awesome. That's it was. Cool. Like, growing up in the teams, it was cool. But my entire time, because I never saw the reality of war, um, I thought Buds was, I thought that's what we were doing for, for a career. Because you go to Team 2 back in the day, the Rudy Bosch errors, and they do log PT. Buddy carry ruck runs and all kinds of weird shit. Like, it was miserable. Mm. Like, the PT, two mile ocean swims every week. Like, it looked like it just continued. So, when we went to Buds, I was, um, I was not in, I was too young to be in good shape. Um, I was in good enough shape. And I was just too dumb to quit. I didn't know any better. Like, yeah. when people would quit on the, the very first day, I couldn't get it through my mind. This isn't going to stop anytime soon, boys. And, it would it confirm my biases when I'd look down the beach and see SEAL Team 1 doing log PT. I'm like, yeah, dude, they're paying us to work out. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like, I, I didn't care. I was superhuman. Like, the whole chafing thing, I didn't get it. 
didn't bother you? No, nothing. When I graduated Hell Week, my dad was, uh, he was contracting them. My mom flew out to pick me up and uh, <laughs> she was having me take pictures. Um, it was a famous photo. They've got that, uh, they've got that, um, that Bud's class book they did, The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. That's on my Bud's class. You can see a bunch of pictures of me in there. And my mom came to pick me up. We had to spend 24 hours in the barracks and then you could go out in town and do whatever. Um, my mom would have taken a bunch of photos do all this, and I missed the bus back to the barracks, like that, that 500 yards, and I sprinted the whole way back there barefoot, <laughs> went back to my room and checked in, and um, it was probably 8 a.m. the next morning. Mom took out a bunch of the boys out for Marie Callender's breakfast, did the whole thing, uh, the whole den mother, and then made me go run the O-course so she could take pictures of my dad. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, man. Went out and ran a full O-course. When you got to Bud's, I mean, Probably everybody over there knew your dad, right? A bunch of the cadre did. Um, my, um, I guess, kind of my quasi godfather was the EXO at Group One at the time, so he picked me up and actually walked me through the quarter deck, and it started. A bunch of the, a uh, bunch of the guys were old Team Two dudes, so they already knew. Full benefit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Full Benny. How about everybody around you? Were they getting full benefit because of you too? <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah, they did, but a lot of it was just isolation, which is fine. How many time, How many guys did you start with? Do you remember? I'll mess a number up. Um, I mean, I thought it was in the two hundreds. I mean, yeah, it was a it was a ton. Um, I started with two four six, and I got rolled. And graduated with two four seven, and I think twenty originals, something like that. It wasn't many. Yeah. If you had to pick one portion of buds, uh, that was your hardest. What was it? Second phase, pool comp. Pool comp. I got rolled for that. Um, just bad advice. Yeah. Bad advice. I um. I mean, when you do it, you have to do a bunch of sequences. Um, you know, they hit you with the whammy knot. They do the whole thing. Um, it's a whole series of procedures you have to do exactly correct. And the advice that I was given was they just want to see you not panic. They want to see you calm, cool, and collected. Don't get wrapped over the procedures. Just... Show them they are not going to rattle you. Done. <laughs> and I went down, they smashed me, and I didn't do basically any of those procedures. They completely flustered me, and I did everything I could do, and then I came up. Fail! <sighs> Ooh, there's one. Same thing happened again. Same, it was a, The final check was a J-Val flick. That was the final thing, and I kept missing it. I was just overcome by events. Um, I let them rattle my cage, and they did. Yeah. Got rolled back the next year um, or the next class, a couple weeks. Um, but it was what I needed. I needed it. So you graduate and you head over to Team 10? Yep. We um, finished up Buds. We all went out to Kodiak, Alaska for winter warfare training. And at the very end of that, they asked for 10 volunteers to deploy early with Team 10. Um, there was a weird cycle. Um, everybody was getting kind of messed up and they needed people to go right now. I think they were giving guys a month off in between getting your trident and checking into the team. So guys wanted to go home. They wanted to see wives and see moms and all that stuff. And nope. Every dude in that class under 19 years old's hand rocketed in the air as fast as they could. No shit. So they had to... Everybody. They had to, they had to make a decision. Mm-hmm. We had a... So Cole, um, he had orders to Team 1. We already knew we were going. He had orders to Team 1. He traded in the middle of our class to go to Team 10. He was from Virginia Beach, and he was big in the surfing, and he wanted to stay out there. And um, I guess he didn't want to break up the bromance, so... Yeah, he swapped right there. Oh, shit. Yeah, we drove straight across. Um, How did they in. pick the 10 guys? Volunteer. So there was only 10 volunteers? They needed 10 people, and yeah, 10 okay. people volunteered. Did you know you were going to war? Oh, yeah, for sure. They told you? Yeah. I mean, there was no, uh, at Team 10, they weren't doing um, a UCOM rotation anymore. Yeah. There was, uh, it was men manning. I think we only had two groups. We had one going to Afghanistan and one going to Iraq, and that's what you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, before we get into that deployment, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll pick up there. Cool.
What's going on, Patreon? Join me on Vigilance Elite Patreon for a live video teleconference. All right, so we're back. You just graduated SQT. You volunteered to go to war, show up to Team 10, and you're 19 years old on your first deployment to Iraq. Yep. How was that? Um, humbling. Yeah. Was there any, before we get into that, was there, did you mesh with, did you have any time with your platoon before you went out the door or did you just show up and it's like, hey, guess what? I graduated early yep. and uh, I'll be uh, heading out the door with you tomorrow. We or, showed up in, uh, don't quote me exactly, uh, I think we showed up in August and we deployed in March. So, yeah, a little bit, a couple of months. Um, we got to hit the major blocks. We got CQB, land warfare. Um, missed all the pro dev, so didn't, wasn't one of the guys went to sniper school or any of that as new guys, so no new guy schools at all. They gave us um, hazmat demo driver, which I couldn't do because I didn't have a driver's license. Um, you had to be 25, so I couldn't do that. I couldn't get a rental car. Um, yeah, it was basically just the, <laughs> it was like the lowest life form on earth. <laughs> but yeah. we had... Uh, we had nine new guys and nine old guys. So it was good, man. The, the mesh was good. The learning curve was high. Um, the standard in that platoon was extremely high. But it should have been. I'm glad it was now. I didn't understand at the time. I thought they were being dicks just to be dicks. Yeah. Um, but if I could have done it all over again, I wish I would have paid attention more. A lot of that, uh, a lot of that resistance came... Um, from feeling like I was already part of it because I'd been born into it. Um, so it was hard for me to let go of. Hmm. You know, a little bit of arrogance, I'm sure. Um, the fact that I knew everybody, like I already knew them. Like the CMC was my dad's best friend. I've known him my entire life. Damn. So it's, it's weird to see him in the hallway like, hey, Master Chief. And see him on the weekend, you're like, hey, Master Chief. <laughs> you know what I mean? What was your dad thinking? Did, what was his reaction that you were going to war right off the bat, 19? I mean, he was happy for me. Was he? Yeah. He was pretty stoked about it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, you could tell he was nervous. You could tell my mom was really nervous. Um, I mean, Iraq in 2004 or five, being shot never entered my mind. Like, yeah. Navy SEALs hadn't been shot. That's not a thing. Like, we're good. It happened sporadically. Nobody's died yet. Not in Iraq. It was the IDs we were worried about. It was like, they were hitting them all day, every day. So when we got there, I mean, that was pretty surreal, like, flying in, you know, take off 19 years old, and, you know, you're on the C-17, getting ready to land, and people start, you know, two hours out, they're breaking the no bands, body armor, helmet, nods, loading guns. I've never deployed before. Apparently, this is completely normal. Like, we landed like we were going to be under fire the entire time. Like, you had no idea. And when, I mean, now that you've deployed, you open it up, and there's a guy with a flatbed pulling off ISU 90s like I thought we would be shot down. Like, the way they were flying in, it was crazy. Um, everybody's getting sick. <laughs> Just, um, it was early in the war. It was a different environment. No one had any, um, any real combat experience. Yeah. Even the older guys in the platoon had been to Afghanistan, but it was more of... Um, the presence patrols. It wasn't sustained combat. They hadn't had it before. So we were all kind of new guys together. Where were you guys? Uh, Baghdad. Baghdad. Yeah. So we uh, we split. We did PSD for a little bit. And then um, we do two weeks of that. So doing the um, all the dignitaries in Iraq. Real quick, PSD's personal security detail. So uh, a lot of teams were doing that for the Iraqi government officials. Yeah, it was a way to a way to stay busy, a way to be employed. Like, hey, if we if they have to put us here for this, maybe they'll let us do DAs too. So we had a strike force set up. Um, and because I was so young, I mean, a lot of the new guys got pushed over to the strike force. Like, they didn't want a 19 year old kid standing in front of CNN, you know, driving around the president of Iraq or whatever else we were doing. Um, so I was lucky in that sense. I got to go over with. 
we did a weird conglomerate with Team 10 and Team 4 from the East Coast. We all deployed together in the same compound. Hmm. And I think we had five and seven, the same thing. So we were just overflowed with people. So we got to work with everybody. It was pretty cool. So what were you guys doing then if you weren't on the PSD team? Doing raids. Raids? Yep. How many straight. raids were you doing? Uh, a couple of week. A couple of week. Yeah. Um, you know, four or five, like staying busy. They, um, But they were all mobility packages. We'd pull out of that base and there was no armor. Um, there was no uh, no armor in the turret gunner. So I'd rock the 50 up front. Um, and it was bad, man. Like, we, uh, you just see the rubble on the side of the road expecting to hit one. You just wouldn't. And we'd make it through and you come back and you're like, okay, got to get some pancakes. Here we go. Got to make it back. We'd drive back and nothing would happen. You're like, every day was a breath hold. Just waiting to get hit and you'd, You'd hear it, the SIG acts would get reported, all the significant activity, all the IDs that were hit the day before, and it's the same route in and out. You have to drive there to start everything. It's like, you know, Marine convoy here, Army convoy there, 10 people killed here. God, like, when is this going to happen? And because the curfew was so strict that time, um, you never saw anybody. We didn't do anything during the day. So at night, I mean, I didn't see an Iraqi, an actual local, for months. No shit. No. Not until we started doing DAs. We just didn't. It'd be a couple dry holes, and you're like, are there people in this country? Like, where are they? The curfew was so stringent right then. You didn't see them. And then all of a sudden, you got on a good target set, and now there's a bunch of people out. And you're like, oh, okay. This is it. It's weird, man. Like, Iraq was a weird animal, especially then being so young, just not really knowing. Yeah. Um, like, the training, I felt... Uh, the training was good, but the mindset wasn't. Like, I had no idea mentally how to prepare for that. I just didn't. It was like, we're doing land warfare in, you know, Arkansas. Like, I don't know what that has to do with driving around Iraq right now. Like, yeah, I'm really good at running a saw on a 60. Like, but we're going to get blown up right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, target discrimination. I mean, you'd see people on the rooftop, ski masks, carrying dishes or, you know, PKs, whatever. You know, are they good? Are they bad? Are we going to shoot these people? Like, don't fire until you're fired upon. And they wouldn't shoot at you. you know? Are they good? He's like, ah, sometimes it's a neighborhood watch. That's a lot of pressure on a 19 year old kid to not yeah. shoot a dude with a PK. Like, you want me to wait until he shoots me? That's kind of a weird thing to say. But, Damn. No. Well, then, how far? So, so we're in your first deployment. And the biggest loss in SEAL team history happens. Yeah, man. So we're in the compound. Um, everybody was there. Um, four, ten, five, seven, we're all in there. We've got a centralized jock. And new guys never came to the jock. We just didn't. You stayed out of it. We stayed in our own little bat cave doing new guy stuff. But I remember I was walking back from the gym one night. And the double doors opened. And it was a huge um, TV screens. You know, typical jock. Cinematic screens all over the place. And uh, this frantic O stuck his head out and grabbed me. He goes, are you at SEAL Team 10? And I said, yeah. And he goes, go get your OIC right now. And I looked over his shoulder and I saw what looked to be the side of a mountain and a big smoldering thing sitting on it. And I ran back out there and I grabbed him as fast as I could and told everybody. All the new guys stayed put and all the old guys ran into the jock. Um, and it only took a couple minutes and you could hear it. Um, you could hear grown men wailing. And they knew. Like, I got goosebumps thinking about it. Fuck, man. You didn't know. So I was supposed to be an echo platoon. I was. And my LPO of golf platoon pulled me out because he knew my dad. So I was supposed to be in Afghanistan. And now I'm in Iraq. But all of our best friends that volunteered all went to echo platoon. And echo platoon is on deployment in Afghanistan. So I think all of our best friends are dead. We think everybody's on the same bird and they're all dead right now. And we hear nothing for like two weeks. You didn't hear anything for two fucking weeks? Nothing. Everything converged in Afghanistan and they put us on River City and we heard nothing. I saw pictures of dead guys in the gym when it came out in Navy Times. Damn. We didn't know anything. We didn't have email accounts back then. Like we weren't, it wasn't like you were on some secure access. Like you didn't, you didn't get anything. They shut down the phones and um, when the CMC finally came in, he briefed on the entire thing, and they broad-brushed the actual ground element. 
I didn't find out about Marcus Luttrell and all of those people for months later. I never heard the story. Um, he was so overtaken by the helo going down that Marcus who? Like, I had no idea. Never even heard that story. Um, he came in, and I remember asking him. Um, everybody walked away, and I grabbed him. I was like, are any new guys dead? He said, nope. And it was a sigh of relief, selfishly, because the new guys are who I knew. And then I thought, oh, fuck. All of that experience is gone right now. He didn't have a total. He just said no new guys, but you knew it was an entire bird full. Like, yeah. you knew that. It's like now the name started to come out. And I remember they, uh, they set us all down. <sighs> we were sitting down uh, outside of a bunch of trailers, big gravel, big uh, fire pit, and we put up the Proxima, like typical team guy shit. And they're playing the memorial service they shot at Little Creek. They're playing it for everybody. And, uh, you know, you see, uh, see Seth Lucas come into frame. They pin his old man's award on him, and I'm fucking bawling my eyes out. And it keeps going through and through. And it gets to a point... Um, Patsy gets up and speaks on Danny's behalf. And I remember I said it. What the fuck is an SDV2 guy doing there? And then SDV1. I'm like, what the fuck is that? My, no one knew. No one said anything. Um, at least not at that time. It didn't make any sense to us. Are they just augments? Are they just, yeah, they're just assisting Echo. We had no idea it was a QRF. At least I didn't. For a long time. Um, and then it started to come out about the lone survivor and everything else. And we started to piece the story back together. But until I was in back at stateside mid second deployment or mid second workup, 2006, I finally heard the story from someone who was there. Mm. I had no idea. They, um, yeah, that helo was the only thing that mattered. Like that was, that was our entire world. Did that, um, cause we were right around the same age that time when I was into and, uh, did that, did that hit you? Like, did the magnitude of what happened actually hit you being that young? Nope. And you didn't know anybody. You know, you didn't know those guys. I didn't know them either. No. It didn't hit me. No, the old guys I didn't know. Um, I mean, you knew some of them. Um, got really tight with their wives afterwards, all the kids, obviously. Um, but no, like, they were, uh, you were platoon chief, echo platoon. I don't know you. Yeah. Like, I'm not in echo platoon. Um, known from reputation, stuff like that. But at that time, there's no way you could understand the magnitude of what that did to the community. Yeah. Like, you talk about a dose of reality. That's reality. Like, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Like, these people are actively trying to kill you. It's like, like to me, it wasn't, it wasn't real yet. It was like a cowardice thing. Like, oh, yeah, they plan IEDs, like this and that. But team guys weren't getting shot. Like, they weren't dying. Like, had a couple. Yeah. Random ones, but not like that. Not like that. Yeah. It's like seals don't die like that. Like you can't just take out that many. It's not a thing. So yeah, heavy dose of reality on the way back. But yeah, the magnitude wasn't probably until extortion actually. No shit. Yeah. That long. Yeah. It didn't hit me until I got, we relieved those guys over there and uh, it didn't, it didn't really sink in until we started seeing some of the Intel reports and they were, I remember uh, I was with a good friend of mine sitting next to him and they it was showing they were showing deeds on there and he just started fucking crying and he would uh, they were stripping his clothes off and he was like I remember when he got that fucking tattoo on his rib cage and I was like oh shit oh, this is fucking the real deal but um, <clears throat> yeah yeah man it's real deal like there were some evil people on this earth, really committed to the cause. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's really hard to train for that scenario, though. It's like how good everybody was on that helo. Like, they were all bad motherfuckers, dude. They were awesome. And it didn't matter. It's like, God, if you just would have let them sit on the ground and then ambushed them, like, some coward's ass shit. Yeah. Like, Yeah. Like, war's not fair. I think that was a lesson learned out of that. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't get the, the chance to fight, the chance to show how good you are, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take another quick break. When we come back, we'll uh, get into your second deployment.
All right, DJ, so we're back from your first deployment and it's 2007. I think you're 22 years old now and you're getting ready to go back to Iraq again for a second time. Yeah. And uh, you found yourself in somewhat of a historic firefight uh, that's been talked about a lot. So um, I'd love to get your take on what happened and, and how that deployment went. Um. Yeah, kind of leading up to that, um, and we'll kind of segue back to it. We, um, on our turnover up when we first flew in there, the, so we had our, our platoon, our sister platoon, and we had a, we were relieving SEAL Team 4. So that was Mike Day's platoon. So our turnover up with our sister platoon is when Mike Day's incident happened. He got shot 27 times. Shit. That's how we kicked off the deployment. That's how it started. Mm-hmm. Fucking hey, man. So we had one of the guys in the sister platoon got shot, got medically retired, took a, a crazy um, round through the arm, and it um, had a bunch of nerve damage and it balled his hand up. He's out, and he was one of our corpsmen too. He's an awesome dude. So we automatically lost him, and we basically just combined forces. Were you on that operation? I wasn't. That was no? our sister platoon, and it was one of the handover ops. Um, so it was Team 4 heavy, and then a little bit of Team 10. Um, you know, the HQ element, a couple of senior guys just to see how he did business. These are what the routes are like. This is what the target set's like. And it just so happened they were going after um, an AQ cell that had just shot down a Marine Hilo. So they had all their guns, had their body armor, had helmets, had night vision, had the whole thing. Fuck. So we kind of rode that wave pretty much the whole deployment. Um, it was super busy, a different area, working for, uh, working for the West Coast uh, teams. So it was great. We were busy, like super busy. And it, it felt like how I thought it would feel. Really? Yeah. Like this is what you envision when you yeah, go in? Yeah, like even, um, even some of the animosity stuff, like um, we'd go to the chow hall and they'd bitch about it because we'd come in wearing tank tops and now you got to wear, like even the stuff we would complain about, it made you feel like, I feel like a Navy SEAL now. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm in a strike force, like this is how it's supposed to feel, like we're gelling, we're going out every night. Like this is, this is what it is. But the reality hadn't set in yet on what we're actually doing because it hasn't happened to you yet. So it's not, it's not a real thing. Yeah. Um, a couple months in that deployment, we're, we're steady, um, engaging with the enemy. It's fine. Um, and one night we go out and we're in a really bad, um, in a really bad section. Where were you guys at? Um, just outside of Fallujah, but we were operating in this little town called Karma. Okay. <laughs> um, and it was good. But um, a lot of palm groves, a lot of, a lot of nasty shit out there we just we were not trained to do. So kind of come into play later about our inexperience. Um, but one night we, we do an offset infill. We're, uh, we're patrolling a target, and we get about 200 meters out, and you could see the entire posture shift of everybody in that assault force. Everybody switched. You could smell it. Like, this is a fucking ambush. <laughs> like, it just is. Walking down the road, the houses we were walking past, like, you just, you were waiting. It was a breath hold the entire way. Um, and I say that because people started doing things they've never done before. The pace they were moving, we've never moved at that pace before. Um, when, we would, um, when we would do patrolling and training, like, there's a lackadaisical patrol and there's a patrol to contact, like, we're going to get hit right now. Everybody was in patrol to contact mode. Like, it's happening right now. No You're waiting shit. for a trade at to throw RD Sims and kick the whole thing off. Like, it was, it's right there. And I remember the last 50 feet sprinting to the building. They had a big overhang, and we'd been getting ISR updates. There's uh, multiple guys on a roof. I'm like, okay. So as we patrol up, there's a bunch of guys in the courtyard of this, and it's, uh, it's an iranian influence cell that we're kind of going after now, and they fight completely different. Um, we locked down some guys on these, um, on these sleepers on the courtyard, and we, we maneuver up. Um, made silent entry. We go in, we're doing our whole clearance, and I bolt straight for the stairs. Um, it's a huge open room. Um, I don't know how to describe it. Um, just a huge open room with little offshoot bedrooms. Made no sense to be a house. It's like a structure. Um, and they had a, a two-tier landing that came up and banked, and then it basically just opened into the roof. Just a an opening in the middle of the roof and you walked up and you're surrounded 360, 720 by the roof. 
stacked up the train and got it right there, right at the last little breach of it. So I'm about this high underneath it. And uh, I stood up and threw on my laser and there was a dude sprinting at me at full blast with a pistol in his hand and unloaded six shots at me. No shit. Yeah, so he unloaded, um, I unloaded on him, got off three rounds in a boat lock. So dropped to my knees and we called Exfil, um, ran around the back, Everybody got their guns um, up and running, and grenades started coming off the roof. Um, so in rally, what had happened is... So hold on. Did you eliminate the threat? Yep. He's dead. Mm -hmm. did he, he didn't hit you. He did. He did hit you. He hit me in the, in the chest plate in uh, one of the magazines. So pistol caliber, like 45, dead center. Um, I mean, dead center. <laughs> Um, so he snacked me there, which I don't know how he did it with a downward angle because that was presented. So blind luck, snacking the plates were good. I don't know where the other five went. I don't know how they didn't hit anybody else. Um, but I mean, he was probably within six feet. I mean, he was there. What you didn't realize, um, in the ISR update we did not get is he was standing at the base of the stairs waiting. They never told us that. He's standing there waiting for us to come up. And there is a, another shooter in a sandbag position with a belt fed, a PK, aimed at the top of the stairs. And he's pulled off a suicide vest and laid it at the base of the stairs and pulled back a command wire. And you can see him. He's holding it. He's waiting to clack it off. And we never know. So if I would have made entry, if I shot that dude and would have continued to go, that guy would have cut me in half. So just blind luck that I got bolt lock and I forced to retreat. Um, so we start trading grenades on the roof back and forth. A um, bunch of different maneuver elements are happening. We've got three or four guys that are fragged from the grenades, our chief included, um, like a corpsman, our turp, our JTAC. So a bunch of guys, not bad, but bad enough. I mean, it's your first time being wounded, like, um, takes you by surprise. Like your wounded eagle, it's like, oh no. Like how bad? Do you instantly think the worst? Um, but we had to win the fight. So yeah. we're trading grenades on the roof, we're doing that whole thing. And um, one of the guys wanted to send a, one of the mams from the courtyard. He grabs him, terp, perfect English. Um, he's like, I know who that is. Oh yeah, and he's like, it's my cousin. Like, terp tells him again, like, send that dude up there and tell him to tell his cousin to come down here. Like, we don't know who's up there. Um, the slant was really weird that night with how many women and kids were supposed to be there. It was bad intel. It was kind of just hodgepodge. And we sent that dude back up there. And he's calling out to his cousin, you know, whatever he's saying, whatever he's saying. And he got halfway up the stairs and poked his head up. And that dude let it go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Killed his own cousin. And here we go. More grenades are coming off the roof. Um, so the whole force now, we're basically locked down inside of this building and grenades are coming off. We don't know how many dudes are on the roof. And now there's multiple maneuver elements of bad guys in and around the city. And we have to fall back now. Um, we got a super badass new guy posted up with a saw. Basically, like, everybody wants that opportunity. Rock the front of this building so we can all run underneath it. That dude stepped out and just wah, 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 sent it. We all ran back and um, we got our first fire mission in. Like a... Uh, a first like no shit fire mission. Damn. So um, that was cool. I didn't know um, I'd been hit yet. You didn't know you'd been hit yet? Mm -hmm. I had no idea. We, uh, I kept having a bolt lock. So I'd fire three rounds, bolt lock. I dumped out a mag, grabbed a new one. And when I did, it cut my fingers. So where the round hit it, it had blown out the back of it, like a big spider web. So when I grabbed it, it filleted my hands open. So I dropped the mag, grabbed a new one. Got the gun back up and running, and for whatever reason, I grabbed it off the ground and put it in my back pocket. I don't know why I did it. I just, I did it. Um, so when we got back on the helo, we're flying out after that whole thing. Um, we got all the medevac guys out. They were fine, minimal injuries, nothing crazy. Um, we're flying back on the helo, and I'm sitting next to, uh, to Jay Redman. And I held up the mag, and I'm looking, I'm trying to focus it with my nods back and forth, and I, I don't know what it is. like. It never, it never even entered my conscious thought that I took it around there. Damn. I didn't know what it was. Put it back in my pocket and we get back to the ready room and we're going in for the debrief. And I dropped my gear and I looked at it and it's still in disbelief. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And I hand it to one of the other guys and he's like, that's a fucking bullet, dude. Oh, sh that is a bullet. That is a bullet. 
dead center. Um, but it was weird when you look at the bullet and the angle it came into. Um, we did a lot of breaching back then. We land a lot. Um, I used to run around with the charges capped in. And I had them all capped in and I had uh, my primary charges in a pouch right there. And it nicked the edge of the pouch where the caps were exposed to. So obviously if it would have hit that blasting cap, that would have been a whole... Damn. That would have been a, been a bad day. So but, for the audience, just real quick, I'm just going to interrupt. Uh, when he's talking about the caps being in, exposed, basically a breaching charge is a bomb, you know, that they use to blow a door, blow a hole in the wall, blow whatever up. And uh, the blasting caps are uh, extremely sensitive. So if that would have hit one of those, uh, it would have been end of the road for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were running on big charges and we blew everything. Um, we blew everything. <laughs> that was the SOP back then. If you could, uh, if you could blow it, you blew it. So you didn't even fucking feel. Mm -mm. You didn't feel the fact that you got fucking pegged by a forty-five in the chest plate. So thinking back on it. Um, the guys behind me said they saw me I'm like, take a reflex. I didn't feel it. And the next morning um, when I stood up and I arched back, it felt like I did too many sit-ups, like sore in the sternum, um, kind of hard to take a full breath, but nothing like what you'd imagine. Like I imagine I would have known instantly like, oh my God. I didn't, the adrenaline was so high that that's kind of what we use for like a training analogy now. Like when that adrenaline dumps, you won't know. Yeah. You won't know. Like in approximately a gunfight that is that close where you see muscle flash and you feel it, it's very different. It's not being shot at from 300 meters. It's not a, it's not a hitting the wall. It's inside of six feet. It's a very different experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. I've never been shot. I don't know, you know, what that feels like, but I always imagined it would uh, knock you on your fucking ass. Yeah, I mean, luckily it didn't. Yeah. yeah. No shit. So... Yeah, we got through that one. That was like reality is set in now. And it's like, okay, all the stuff in training now, now everything is slowed down. The CQB is super crisp now. It's all real world. We're very current. And it's good. Like business is great. We're going out every night, every other night. Um, we've got assets. It's like, it's, it's awesome. As good as it ever could have been. Um, and we go back. This is, um, so the firefight you were referencing was uh, the one with, Jay Redden and those guys. Um, that was September 10th. Um, so almost on the anniversary. And uh, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, but in a positive way. Um, zero loom. There wasn't an ounce of moonlight out, nothing. And for the guys that don't run around with night vision, um, those things aren't perfect. They're not, man. You don't have any ambient light out there they don't work very well. They just don't. So we were going back to the exact same spot, two houses down from where that thing happened. So we called it the karma house. Like bad karma, here we go. And we were going to land on the X. We're gonna blow the front door and take this thing down hard. That's what we did back then. Um, so flying helos right to the front door and this is what we're doing. And we knew from past experiences exactly what kind of resistance we were going to meet and we plan for the worst. Like I went in on that thing completely knowing in that first room I was going to get shot. Yeah. Like they had belt feds, they had suicide vests, like these guys are committed for sure. If we go in right now, that first room is going to be sketchy. And we landed on the ax and we ran through that thing like we've done a million other times and there was no one there. Dry hole. And then we get an update that all those guys had left and had ran out the back. And now they are in adjacent essentially a cornfield. But if you imagine, um, imagine an endless field of nothing, just a plowed field. And then right in the middle of it is about 500 yards of six foot tall. I don't even know what you'd call it. It's like straw, but it's not, I mean, you can't see anything. Um, and they're trying to walk us down on top of this guy. So we all switch over. It's, um, probably six or seven of us and we all get online and we were all starting to walk down. Um, we've all switched over to fires and we're listening and two of the new guys and one of the EOD guys had not switched over to fires. They were, we literally interlocked arms. That's how bad it was. You couldn't see shit. We Damn. couldn't lose anybody inside there. 
Um, we've never walked through the palm groves before. We didn't have a dog. We, we didn't have the experience. And looking back on it, it's one of the most dangerous things I've ever done because you knew the guy in there had a gun, like for sure. <laughs> you knew that uh, they run around with SBS and you know they're committed. So now we are walking on there. So if you imagine just a, a big open field with a big sparkle in the center of it and we're going to walk towards it and we're going to walk until we find this guy <laughs> okay so we do completely committed interlocked arms and we are walking forward and we're getting the updates 15 feet 10 feet you're standing on him <laughs> and you see everybody looking down like he's not here third person from the right you are standing on him and we all look over to the right nothing I'm like what the fuck so we're all on a line standing right there and jay calls an audible he's like whole maneuver element take a right hand turn because we know there's an, an open field we just have to cross and now it's completely open now we can regather our shit and we can assault from this side if it's walking through all this all this crazy brush we can approach it from the open side and just walk in the brush a little bit, maybe call him out, do something else. And when we turn right, this element stayed. They didn't get the word. So now we have a bad guy, our element, and then another element. Now we're in a Polish ambush. We turn, we walk out, and we enter this beautiful manicured open field. There's not an ounce of cover anywhere in it. There's not a rut. There's nothing. There's not a rock. There's a single tire, and it's about 20 feet, yeah, 30 feet from the edge of the... Uh, from the edge of the brush line. It's just out there. And we're standing there in a team guy gaggle, standing around, like wondering, what the fuck? Is this guy really there? Is it a dog? Is it some animal? Like, these guys are clearly lost. And we don't realize that that bad guy is in there, probably six feet inside, and he's looking at us. And we're from the middle of the wall, and we're close. We're having a full on conversation. And um, at one point, we're trying to relay to the other guys because now we know we've lost three. Now they're lost in brush country. And we have to reconsolidate them so we can deal with this guy because now we know the reality. We've turned the entire profile. Blue forces, bad guy, blue forces. We've got all the rest of the guys over here on, on the west side. And now we're trying to do a link up. Like we have to get them around to reconsolidate with us. Um, the blue force picture and knowing where everybody is is... Um, it's challenging at times, but you really have to know then. We basically walked right up to the edge. It's, um, you know, Jay's there, our corpsman, our terp, the JTAC, and a guy we'll just call Matty is standing there with me. And we're all in kind of a team guy gaggle. And Jay hears something in the bushes. And I think he believed at the time it was the guys. And he screamed out, hey. And when he did, that dude let off the biggest Hollywood belt-fed burst I've ever heard. Oh, and shit. everybody dropped. It was like, um, we used to do the new guy scenarios. You know, you're doing land warfare, the first contact and all the headshed dies. Just, and now you've got to drag around, like, you know, playing war games. That's what it was like. Everybody hit the deck. And there was a tree probably 30 feet that way. And I remember I turned, I heard it, watched them drop, and I was sprinting so fast to that thing. I remember the dust kicking up in front of me when he was tracking me. Um, I dove behind the tree, and he pounded on that tree for what seemed like an eternity. Um, I was on my back looking up. I mean, you can imagine, helmets cockeyed, there's no ambient light, I can't see shit through my nods, um, and there's just dirt blowing all over me. I mean, I am consumed by this. I don't even know where he's at now. I don't know if he's on his feet chasing me down. Like I'm just overcome with withering fucking fire. Um, and then it stops and he pans back over and he starts to engage the dudes. Um, this thing goes on for, um, for a little bit and we're trying to reconsolidate. Um, the JTAC has went out and he's trying to grab people. Now he's behind a tire. I remember looking over and seeing, um, Jay and I remember him sitting upright and I watched him get shot one more time, um, right in the face. And it looked like that was it. He hit the ground so hard, you knew he was dead. Um, so 
If it's an audible, it has to be made. We have the JTAC in behind this tractor tire. But I mean, it's a, it's a tractor tire. It's not big. It's about that and half the ground. Serves no purpose. And he's behind it. And I'm directly adjacent from him looking at him. Like, I have an out, out this way. We can't because we have all these dudes that are shot up. And I remember it was like the scene from Black Hawk Down. Come to me. Fuck you. Come to me. Ready? Yep. And I got up and I ran as fast as I could and I dove um, <laughs> like a baseball slider in behind that thing. And it, it was such a sigh of relief to feel another human next to me. Um, I was so thankful that he was there. And now we have to figure out how to get out there and bring those people back here. And this whole thing's happening very, very fast. Um, so Jay's been shot multiple times. He's, uh, he's discombobulated. He's talking. And this guy's still trying to shoot him, but he can't see shit because it's black. So if you're quiet, he can't hear you. <sighs> the bravest thing I have ever seen in 17 years happened on that night. Um, I watched Maddie get up and run forward after he'd already been shot and grab our corpsman and is dragging him backwards. Just like out of the movies, Corman pulls out his pistol and is shooting into this bush line. Um, and Maddie gets shot again. Boom. Spins him around and dumps him. He gets back up, grabs him, and gets shot again. Dumps him, and he gets back up and continued to drag him back until we got them all back to the tractor tire. You know, we're all pulling him in there. And we basically just dogpiled on him, just plates on plates, um, just trying to build up a human wall to not let these people be shot again. Um... And he's still shooting us the entire time. He hasn't let up. Um, he just doesn't know where we're at now. So if we can keep everybody quiet, we've got hands over mouths, like people are screaming. We had uh, the corpsman got shot through Tib Fib, shattered his leg. Maddie got shot through the brachial artery, hit his humerus and shattered that. And it flipped over the back of his neck. And I remember, because we talked about it later and it made sense, he looked very confused at one point um, in between dragging the corpsman back. And he said he was looking for his arm. Um, when it broke, it snapped and went over his neck and he looked down and just saw this. Um, couldn't see it. Um, I mean, there's no moonlight. You can't see anything. You can't see under nods right there. It's just gone. You look down and there's a stump there. So he doesn't know. He's been shot in the leg. Um, Jay's been shot in the leg and the, um, and the side plates. I think he took a double stack to the elbow. So it blew out his entire arm. And then he took one through the face that basically removed his jaw, removed his nose, um, and you could look inside him. It was as, as bad as it could have been. Um, so we get them back and we go into T triple C mode. Tourniquets on there. We're packing wounds. We're doing that. And thank God for that course. My, f <laughs> um, I don't know where we'd be without that. Uh, the live tissue training and all that. That was, uh, I was so prepared for that. Um, we were in and out of that blowout kit so fast to, uh, and I, I joke with Maddie about it. He was, um, I put the tourniquet on him. He was begging for me to stop. I was like, two more, two more turns. Finally got the blood to stop. I mean, I had my fingers inside his arm, feeling out that thing. Um, the medics working on Jay and um, the corpsman, putting on tourniquets, pressure dressings, all that. And I remember having a distinct conversation with Maddie. He's begging me for quick clot. He's like quick clot over and over and over. I remember from talking to uh, the surgeons during the training, he's like, if you dump quick clot in there, the only way to remove it is to cut it out. And it's inside of his bicep. And I mean, to me, I have the bleeding stopped. I have it under control and I'm not pointing quick clot in you because they're going to have to cut it out of you. Like I'm saving you. You're not dying here. Like you don't need that quick clot. Um, we had a bunch of hemostatic dressings. Like I'm packing this thing. It's fine. And uh, he wouldn't shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> so I told him, yeah. And I grabbed a, a thing of quick clot and I mean, this is underneath a tractor tire where our rounds are coming over. I was like, I've got it. And I pretended like I did it and I went like that. <laughs> and uh, he's like, thank you so much. <laughs> so yeah, I, you never got quick lot. Um, so the next thing, we, uh, we have tourniquets on them. We are talking about what we're going to do now and he is still engaging. And the JTAC J um, starts prepping a fire mission and it's close. Um, it's the closest... Uh, at that point, is the closest uh, fire mission to coalition forces the entire war. No shit. Yeah. Not close. 40... That's the mate. Um, 10 meters, 15 meters. 10 fucking meters. I mean, close enough to where you could take a grenade and throw it. Holy shit. I mean, like it was, 
and they started walking him in. By this time, the other element we had had maneuvered away. Um, nobody was firing because we didn't have um, we didn't have a pitcher. We didn't know where this dude was coming from. We didn't know where our forces were, and we thought <laughs> we thought that if we were to engage this guy, we would have hit our own blue forces. So there was a big lull in the fire, and we were basically just being withered. That we were, we were just getting chewed up. Um, I mean, strobes are getting shot off helmets, like it's like it's in there. And they're everywhere but hitting human beings. So we've essentially taken the tractor and we've stacked up plates in between them on our sides, and now we're just working on people. We're laying on top of people, um, doing whatever we can, and Jay's prepping for a fire mission, and he's asking for 25 Mike Mike and 40 Mike Mike, and basically to start walking it in. And I remember a distinct conversation. They said, no. They said, it's too close. And he said, we're going to fucking die anyway. Juliet Alpha sent it, gave his initials, and he, they started dropping it, and you could feel it. Boom, 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 boom. boom. You, could, <laughs> you could feel the vibrations start to get closer and closer and start to bounce you off the ground a little bit, and it kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, and then they started going tally on target. And, uh, I mean, you could hear that dude, the impacts. You'd hear him smack. Um, you could hear him screaming, and it was very satisfying. I just let him go. Like, let him go. Like we're not walking back up that tree line again. Let that dude die. We called in. Um, we called in for a medevac. They landed right on the X, um, right there where we were. We loaded him on there, and I jumped in. Um, the corpsman had already been shot, so we had him, Maddie, and Jay Redmond. Um, and we talk about the typical team guy shit sometimes about if this happens, just put me out of my misery. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. If I get hit by an IED and it blows my dick off, just finish me. Like people say that shit. Yeah. That would have been one of the times. Um, if my face looks like this, put me down. And he was the most coherent, the most calm dude I have ever seen. Sitting upright, leaning forward, letting shit pour out of his face so he could breathe. Um, and he didn't say much, man. Um, I don't know if the shock hit him. I don't think he knew how bad it really was. Um, so I'm working on Maddie and the Hilo. We're kind of doing the whole comb thing. Running down his fingers, we're finding bullet holes, we're trying to patch all this stuff up, and we get him back. Um, those helo pilots flew that bird so fast. Um, I thought they were going to suck us out of the bird. Like we had to shut the doors. I've never been in a 60 that flew that fast, ever. I mean, to this day. That thing, <laughs> that thing was in a full attack mode the entire way back. It was the fastest shit I've ever been in. And thank God for it. Um, some of the stuff you don't think about, like um, the tourniquets slipping. Now the compartment syndrome sets in, all the blood's getting pushed out, now it gets loose. Now we start blowing blood all out of it. Like, it's in my mouth, it's all over me, like I'm covered in it head to toe, like it's, I mean, it looks like a scene out of Black Hawk Down in the back, back of that helo. Like there's just med kits everywhere and just people laid out. It's like another dose of reality, you know, team guys do get shot and if you're, if you're not trained to handle that situation, you won't. You won't, you won't rise to that. Like if I wouldn't have been through TCCC, if all those dudes wouldn't have played out that exact scenario hundreds of times in training, I don't know what would have happened. Like, it's a testament to how good those dudes were prepared, that JTAC, the balls he had yeah. to drop that. The confidence he had in that AC-130 crew. Like, if you miss that thing, like, your first round for windage, it was so close it could have killed us. It's like, that's the confidence. Um, it was humbling, man, to get back from that thing. I remember we... um. We dropped those guys off. I wasn't there for the rest of the target. What happened after that? Um, I was probably gone for an extra two hours, and I came back from the debrief, and I walked in, and, you know, I'm an emotional fucking wreck. Um, I would have sworn that Matt was going to die for sure. Like, Jerry looked like he was dead. Um, I never thought he'd make it. I mean, just the way his face looked. Like, it looked so bad. Um, but outside of his arm, no real life-threatening injuries. Um outside of a shit ton of cosmetic stuff. I mean, he, it's a really lucky way to get shot. Matty was a, he was a different animal. He got a bad infection. External fixators, you know, just all over the place in the hospital. Um, a very surreal moment, um, especially for that deployment. Just, that's how we're gonna end this whole thing. It's just, it's a somber way to go home on that deployment. And uh, I never really got to process it. I didn't have time. Um, just the whole reality of what had happened, kind of what we'd been through, you know, together as a group. Um, being in firefights is one thing, like being in that is completely different. 
like just helpless. I couldn't shoot back. I couldn't do anything. I could just lay there and put my plates in front of that guy and hope he shoots me and not you. I can give you a tourniquet outside of that, man. Outside of moral support, like we're all just in this together. And I would have bet anything. There's no way we would have walked away from that. There's no, I thought we were dead after the initial contact. It was so close. It was so violent. Um, and I think it was kind of that, um, not lackadaisical attitude because we were definitely wired tight for that, but it's not reality until it's reality. Like, that's not going to happen. Yes, it is. Whether you want it to or not, it's happening right now. So, um, yeah, a lot of good lessons learned from that. Um, a lot of stuff that I carried with me my entire life, to even in training. You know, a lot of guys will put on this Hollywood show during training. They'll, uh, they'll run out there and they'll like, try to save the princess or some kind of crazy shit. No, sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to get up and you have to say, cover me, and you have to go out and do that. And sometimes you have to call in danger close fire missions. Sometimes you have to run out there being shot already and drag back a dude to save his life. Like, there's no argument with that. That's the most heroic shit I have ever seen. Ever. <laughs> um, I mean, to this day. Like, if I had one defining moment where I stood back and I was just starstruck, that's it. Like, like if, I had to, if I had to capture a, a you know, a 30-second clip of, do you want to be a Navy SEAL? Why do you want to be one? Because people will do this for me. That'd be it. That'd be Jay calling a fire mission, Maddie run out there grabbing back to Corman, dragging him back. It was a badass move. That is some heavy shit. <laughs> oh, fuck, man. Damn. So, yeah, I, um, I'd almost been killed like six, seven times on that deployment. It was, it was getting rough, and that was kind of the, the last straw. We were about to do turnover. They medevaced all those guys home, and then they sent me back on the first bird. And when I landed, I went and saw, uh, went and saw Maddie in the hospital. His mom was in there, and um, it was cool, man. Like Then the connection to reality, because we hadn't had that before. I've never had a guy in a platoon be shot, and it gave me a really good insight on what happens when you actually get shot. Like, it's not the movies. It's not a graze. It's not like, oh, yeah, he took and he continued to fight for six hours, and he doesn't miss a rotation. That bullet hits your bone. You're out of this program, maybe forever. You're definitely out of it for nine months. Multiple surgeries, now infections and rehab and physical therapy. And you got to get cleared by the doctors and everything else. Everything that goes in behind the backside to get you back up and running. It wasn't a reality. We never had to deal with it. Like, I definitely take that forward now to training. Like, we do some munition shit. I use that as a prime example. If you haven't seen what happens when a bullet hits human bone on the blue side or on the bad side, the bullet doesn't care. It's doing the exact same amount of damage. Like, you're out of the game for six months, man. Yeah. So. But, yeah, that was uh, that was how we wrapped up 2007. That's pretty fucking rough. <laughs> yeah. You keep in touch with all those guys still? Or? Yeah, I was just texting with, um, with the JTAC. Actually, day before yesterday. Really? I'm trying to get him to come in and do the skateboard thing. Um, yeah, get some art therapy on. Get the boys back together. I think everybody... Um, well, those guys will admit or not, I don't give a shit like that really fucked us up. Um, yeah. It's rough, man. Yeah. You gotta sit there and just wait to die. Damn. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it's a surreal experience, just the proximity of it. Um, that's something that can't be, um, that can't be overlooked. Like, it's different being pinned down from a couple hundred meters away, like you can get up and maneuver. Like, not this one. Like, if that dude would have stood up and just walked us down, it would have been over. So it's like all the lessons learned on laser placement, how to focus your nods, ambient conditions, everything else. It's like, I know now. It's like one more pearl. Yeah, lock that one away. I won't ever forget that again. Damn. So it's like everything, you know, I think we kind of take that forward in the training now. It's like all these lessons have been learned, not because, you know, we're superhuman, but because we're honest and we fuck things up. And everything you're doing right now, I've fucked up before. There's no reason for you to make the same mistake. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the big thing is just not being, uh, not being mentally prepared for that situation. 
you thought you were, but I hadn't hadn't looked at it in a in a realistic lens yet. It was still video game mode. It was still training mode. It was that's not going to happen to me. Even though we were walking down, interlocked arms, waiting to get shot, wasn't reality yet. He was scared shitless. I knew it was coming, any moment. But in until it goes loud, it's not real. Fuck, man. I wasn't being home after that. Terrible. I was fucked up, man. I had a. Uh, I was dating a chick at the time. Um, she. Uh, <laughs> shit just went south, dude. I was just. I was in a bad spot. Um, everything sent me over the edge. Just super hyper vigilant. Um, I just couldn't shake it. And uh, I think I really started to obsess over everything then. Like the details and training, um, training methodology and just, like I really became a student of the craft then. Like then I got it. All the shit, all these old dudes have been talking. This is why. This is what they were trying to prepare me for, but they didn't have a formula to give it to me. They didn't have a, they didn't have a movie. They didn't have a, they didn't have their own sea story to tell me this. They just knew from training over and over and over, this is what it has to be. And they were right. Like if you make training so realistic, you don't know the difference because of your mindset. It's very hard to trip people up. If I paint it real in my mind during training, my body won't know the difference. Mm. Fuck. Let's take a break. Yep. That was heavy. All right, man. So we're back. That was a pretty fucking devastating deployment. But uh, you came back and a little bit of good happened. You met your wife. Yep. So how did that happen? So after 2005, um, we had the Red Wings thing go down and most of the wives stayed local. Um, So we all stayed there. They all a bunch of them lived offshore drive, so that became just our, our running crew. Um, we'd go over there and do family dinners at Laura McGreevy's house all the time. and um, It just became a big melting pot of Gold Star families. Um, and I met Patsy through them. So, um, yeah, never met her before. Didn't know Danny. Didn't know any of that. I'd seen her for, you know, a five-minute segment before. And, um, yeah, Gold Star community kind of brought us together which was pretty taboo let me backtrack just real quick because the audience doesn't know this so you eventually wound up marrying patsy Mm -hmm. who previously was married to danny Dietz, who died in operation red wings so she's a gold star yep so yeah which at the time was um it was taboo nobody did that they um this is going to sound bad but i'll say it um we kind of wrote them off like they're untouchable once your husband dies, like you can't date again. Um, and I know team guys did it. I did it too. You judge them. Like how long are they supposed to wait? Do they wait 10 years? Like you can't judge people for that. You have no idea what they're going through. And kind of the, the school of thought where I came up in the teams, um, I fell in love with her right off the bat and I didn't give a shit if she was gold star or not. Um, and I caught hate for it. I did had answers and tough questions. Um, I didn't care. What was it about her that you liked so much? Um, her understanding. She got it. She knew exactly what it was. Um, reality had smacked her. Um, her stepdad was a SEAL. So she'd been in the Navy. She knew the commitment. Um, and she served herself. Like She knew exactly what it was. She knew what her deployment was, and she knew the reality of it. Um, I didn't have to explain it to her. I feel like that's a big thing in the teams is people marry their high school sweetheart, after you've been gone for four years and you come back and she has no idea that you're going to be gone 250 plus days out of every year. Like she has no idea you're going to come home with, you know, three weeks of 
nasty ass laundry, drop it off and leave for a two week training trip. I didn't have to explain that to her. She already knew and she was bought in. So it made, uh, it made that transition so easy because she was as dedicated as I was. So she, uh, she really let me, she let me obsess. Like she knew where I had to go to get to the level I wanted to get and she encouraged it. So yeah, I mean, she saved me for sure. How long were you guys dating before you got engaged? Um, about a year and a half, so. A year and a half? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you, so you met her pretty much right when you got home? Yeah. And then by the end of the next workup? Yeah, by the next workup, um, I think around, I think it was Thanksgiving that year or something like that. Um, proposed to her in front of her old family and my old family, and um, the community kind of erupted in a positive way. It was awesome. That's cool. Yeah, dude, it was as it was supposed to be. Yeah. So on the on this trip home, it sounds like it was pretty eventful. You you met your wife, you got engaged, you screened for green team. Yep. Um, started my third workup. We um, I was in a very uh, I was riding an emotional roller coaster daily. I just was. Um, I was drinking back then a lot. Um, just trying to numb my senses. I didn't care what it was. Um, luckily, I never did anything really stupid. Um, definitely had my moments. Um, that was the only thing I knew. I didn't know what else to do. Um, people that I could talk to wouldn't talk. Other people that had been exposed to similar things, they uh, they put up this facade like, um, fuck's wrong with you? So I just, I did the exact same thing. I walled it up like, nope. I won't even address that. I won't address any of these feelings I have. I won't address the anxiety, um, my performance anxiety, going into like that 2008, 2009 year um, was through the roof. Like having panic attacks and I didn't know what they were. I thought I was having little mini strokes. If you haven't had one, they're, it's alarming. Like just sitting down in a cold sweat. Like, yeah, I have no idea what's coming over me right now, but I know it's not good. <laughs> And I know I can't say anything to anybody because they'll pull me out of this job. And that's not happening. So we have to do what we do. Suffer in silence. Just be quiet and continue doing your job. And that's what you have to do. Um, fortunately for me, right around that time, we started a new workup. And I got a, I got a new platoon chief who uh, used to be over at the command. His name's Barrett. And um, he was everything I needed. Like... I mean, you couldn't have you couldn't have molded a better dude at that moment in time for me. He um, he talked to talk, he walked to walk, and he performed, and he was he was nasty. He was he was um, because usually you know, guys kind of they have a shelf life, and they don't you know your platoon chief or your uh, your troop chief isn't making the entries every time. He doesn't need to be the best shot anymore because he's commanding, and controlling everything. It wasn't like that with that dude. He outperformed everybody. And he basically set the bar at what development group is supposed to be. I'm like, that's what it became. Like, I can't outshoot him. I can't out PT him. I don't know more about CQB than him. I don't have the combat experience he does. Um, and it humbled you, which is exactly what I needed. Exactly what everybody needed. We needed, we needed to see the insight. I needed to see what you could accomplish if you, um, if you went all the way. And that's what that dude did. He showed us, like, if you want to be a professional, if you want to be the guy, you have to go all the way. Whether that was good advice or bad advice, I took it literally. And um, I started to set up little walls, um, little break-off points in relationships and friendships and everything else. If you impede anything on this progression, I'm done. Not one fucking second will I give to you because you're not worth the end state. You're not, you're not worth me sacrificing my dreams and my hopes and all my wants and wishes. I want to be the best Navy SEAL I can possibly be. And if you slow me down one second, I'll never talk to you again. Like, I don't have time for it. Like, this community, that organization, this job deserves the very best of me. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything. Tactically. And you have to completely, in my opinion, to reach uh, the highest level you possibly can... You have to cut out all the other bullshit. And I thought that job deserved it. I did. I grew up with my entire life, and you've never met a dude who loved being a Navy SEAL more than me. 
I just did. Every day I woke up, even through the bullshit, where everybody's complaining in the platoon space on this and that. I loved it. I'd come home and I'd just, I'd just smile, man. Just thankful to be there. Thankful that I'm doing exactly what I, uh, what I was put on this earth to do. I loved it. Did you cut any, did you cut any important relationships or was it just acquaintances and, and little bullshit? No, I cut off. I cut all kinds of shit out. Um, we had, um, uh, people in a platoon life, um, people that spread a lot of hate, a lot of discontent, a lot of shit talking. Um, a lot of guys that call them nine to fivers. The last one in here, you show up five minutes before our first muster and you're the first dude bouncing out of here at 4 PM. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Birds of a feather. Just, I'm going to shun myself and I'm going to isolate myself with only people that are better than me and that are going to help me achieve the level I want to achieve. The people that want to stay late and train, the guys that want to show up early and work out, the guys that are doing O courses on Saturday and Sunday, like the guys who are going to fully commit. That's who I'm going to surround myself with. And it's the best thing I ever did. Um, it gave me the focus. I could just strip out everything and I could just tunnel vision. Every day had a purpose. Like today I'm doing fitness. I'm not checking my phone. I don't have social media wasn't a thing. You didn't have to deal with any, any kind of bullshit like that. Um, but you could just scrub away bad relationship toxicity out of your life. So, um, we do that deployment. Um, it was a long stand down. It was really eating away at, uh, at the boys, the overall collective. Um, long story short, we, uh, we deployed in a big joint fashion and the Rangers, uh, had an issue. Back they, to Iraq, you deployed. Back to Iraq, back to Baghdad. Um, had the all the assets, time. third time. Um, full rotation. And uh, it was awesome. Like, the target set we inherited was amazing. Like, we were going to be getting it. And I think we were there for 10 or 15 days. Um, and we were just feeling ourselves out. The, the asset schedule and everything else. Like, all the things that actually make the machine run. We were slowly figuring out. I was a team leader at the time. Um, so I'm in all the briefings and all the meetings and the Rangers go out and they get into a firefight and they kill a guy and it happens to be one of the Sheikh's son-in-laws and they threw some political shitstorm into the air and they stood us down for 90 consecutive days. So we have all the task force people there. We have everything, helos, everything. And every day they'd come in, roll 24, roll 24 should be on Friday. It's a long weekend. It's a four-day weekend. On Tuesday, we'll get an update. Friday, we'll get an update. And they kept doing that the entire time. So, I mean, you can imagine. Yeah. You get a bunch of guys overseas that just want to fight, just want to get out of the door, and you're not letting them, and you're not telling them why. Like, we didn't do anything. I didn't shoot that dude. I wasn't on that target. None of our people were. Why are you punishing us? And then you got to feel being a political pawn. And then you realize that it was nothing to do with us. Just some guy flexing. It's not going to let you do your job, but it eroded the cohesion of that entire organization. Like we were at each other's throats, man. Damn. It was bad. Um, just the living conditions. Like you could, you wouldn't see people for days. There was no reason to have a meeting. It's like we weren't training. We were just rusting. Um, and luckily, Barrett kind of pulled us out of that, and he'd have um, basically pulled all the guys together. We'd do CQB. We go to flat range. We started training that group within the group. That spread the collective, and we kind of just, you know. It took a little bit, but we all got back on step. And on around the 90th day, he came in and he said, fuck it, we're moving. <laughs> and we lifted that entire package and we drove it down the road a couple hours um, to Fob Warhorse. And we set up there and it was busy. Like it was, uh, it was everything we wanted to do. Um, we inherited a bunch of target sets from, uh, from the army side, which is really good. Got to interface with those guys a lot. Got to learn about palm groves and a bunch of new TTPs that we hadn't even thought about. Um, things that would have really helped us in 2007, we're now learning now. I'm like, yep, I've been there. I know exactly what he's talking about. So we got to learn a shit ton. Uh, we got to put it to, put it to good use, it was good. Who are you working with from the Army? Um, so we had a Ranger element with us. Um, we had the Tier 1 personality there. 2-2 um, two -two SES was in the same compound. Um, so he was a... It was so funny, man. The uh, the SES, I fucking love those dudes. 
they'd, uh, they'd roll through the chow hall and they've all got American flag patches on. I'm like, it's of the patch. And he's like, you gotta blame it on somebody. <laughs> Fuck assholes. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Uh, those guys were great, man. Just, um, I remember seeing them. You see all the unit guys, you see the SAS guys. I mean, I'm a kid and they look like they're seven foot tall. Like, they look like Marcus Cabone. Like, they look enormous. They've all got huge beards and long hair. And like, holy shit. That's what the pros look like. Like, now you get to see it up close. Just before, I mean, it's just it's just us. You get to see the other organization. You're like, and you get to hear what they're doing going out at night, and you don't get to. So you get to hear about this huge firefight they got into, and you can. You got to sit there with the rangers and twiddle your thumbs and play reindeer games until we got the lift and shift. And it was like, okay, let's all be big boys again. And um, it was fine. It was it was a decent deployment. Nothing to, nothing to really write home about. Um, but it showed me how, uh, showed me the seesaw method. If the op tempo goes up, morale and warfare can go down. Like you don't need to have Xbox and flat screen TVs and all this crazy shit. If you're working every night, you sleep on cots in a tent with no AC, eating MREs, the happiest dude you'll ever see. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit. When that doesn't happen, morale has to go up somehow. And there was nothing to give you. You can't booze. You can't leave the country. There's nothing to do. You're just stuck there and you just have to watch other people go out and work and just to watch how, um, how that eroded the unit cohesion and did, um, and it took a while to get it back. Like I me, mean, you had to really, really bring the boys in like movie time, just, you know, not, not mandatory fun, but you had to do things to bring everybody back in to re-explain the why. I think part of the training, part of the mindset conversations, the mission planning conversations <clears throat> would they take such a philosophical role then because of him that um, everybody would buy in. It was like nothing you've ever heard before. His thought process on mission planning. That's a completely different school of thought. Like that is a, uh, okay, that's, that's a new concept to us. Just um, the whole thing, just everything. The target approach, the, the methodology between everything. Everything was to the why. So he was teaching all you guys that. That's yeah. a fucking oh, dude, he's, hell of a leader. He is, man. He's amazing. Um, he got to stay and do a troop chief right after that, which, I mean, anybody who's worked with him, I mean, he's a demigod in my eyes. Like, I fucking love that dude. If I had to pick one dude right now that I'd put on my dream team, like, that'd be one of my first picks. He was great, and I needed him so bad at that moment. Um, and we came back from that deployment, and uh, I was kind of on a negative crash. I was trying to stay positive because I had green team to look forward to. And, uh, you know, I got married, did all that. We flew over to Spain, had the honeymoon, came back. <sighs> got into a blowout with, uh, with my old man. Like, uh, not a big blowout, just an argument. And it escalated into... Uh, not speaking, um, basically starting green team in the blind. So in January of 2010, had an argument and it escalated from there and it got worse and worse and worse. And, um, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't have any distractions. Um, that platoon chief told me exactly what green team is going to be like. I've seen my buddies go through it. I've heard the horror stories. I know how much pressure is on it. And uh, that's what he kept saying. He's like, you have to have a perfect day every day. No distractions. No booze. No chick drama. Break up with your girlfriend. Do whatever. Don't buy a puppy right now. Like, it's the only thing that matters. Lock it in right now and give it your total commitment, and you'll be successful. And that's what I had to do. So, yeah. Um, a couple months turned into... A really long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many guys started the green team? Um, called somewhere between um, 80 and 90. How many came out? Um, 20, 20, 22. Not many. Low 20s. Yeah. You want to go into any of that? Yeah, we can. Let's do it. Um, 
What do you want to talk about? Let's talk about the first day of green team. <sighs> what happens? Um, we show up and do a screen test. Show up and do a physical test. It's the only known in the entire selection process. You know exactly what it is. It's written on a piece of paper. Everybody knows what it is. And it doesn't matter. That is the most stressful thing you'll ever do. It just is. Um, it's by design. You know, it was... It was like a dream come true just to be there um, until we started the screen test. <laughs> and you get a bunch of dudes, uh, a bunch of the guys that have already made it, come out and they watch you. And they hold for you for sit-ups. They count your push-ups. They count your sit-ups. They tell you if your pull-ups are right. And that is a very intimidating thing. Like you're, you're a college football player and you're coming out to, for your pro debut and Tom Brady's throwing footballs to you. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no pressure. And back in the day, um, they look like Vikings. I mean, super long hair, big long beards, and they looked fucking mean. They did. And it was intimidating. And I loved it. <laughs> I did, man. I, I I got off that bus, dude. And I I used to take Benadryl before Green Team. I get so excited. I get so I get so amped up, I take Benadryl to try to calm myself down. Um it's like a cheap man's beta blocker. But um, I loved every minute of it. It was um, two different schools of thought. You could try to survive it. You could try to polish all the way through and come out at the end and be more capable. My advice that uh, I was given to me was take every day, like it's your last day, and try to absorb as much knowledge out of that fucking place as possible. And that's what I did every day. Um, there's a lot of pressure to perform. We talked about that addiction. Um, every day you want to perform in the fear of... Because now I had that falling out with, uh, with my parents. The thought of not making it now really set home. The thought that I would have to come home and look at Patsy after all the shit she's been through and tell her I didn't make it. I couldn't fathom it. It haunted me at night. Um, wasn't sleeping. Um, yeah, the pressure consumed me. I try to use it uh, to my advantage, but it's hard, man. It's yeah. hard when every day, it's like you see the best dude I've ever worked with just got dropped. I'm like, why the fuck am I still here? I don't really care. So one more day. Do they tell you why you get dropped? Yeah. They do? No, yeah, they tell you. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's team guy to team guy. They tell you exactly why. And looking back on it now, um, that's exactly how it has to be because you know what the end state is. I mean, it's hard for people to hear, like your ego gets put in check, but you're not good enough to be here. Whether that be a person, personality thing, a performance thing, it doesn't really matter. Like, you can try to come back or you can't. Does everybody have the option to come back? No. Nope. Or do you have to be invited back? Be invited back. Do you go through the screening again or um, they give yeah. you a class up? Um, I'm sure it's different every time though. Um, I know a lot of guys have to rescreen. Some guys will stay there and they'll roll back if they get hurt or uh, they mess something up. It's kind of like how weak in the sense if you get past a certain block, sometimes you don't have to redo that block. Unless yeah. you really mess it up, you got to redo the whole thing. Which, I mean, that's what, um, that's what most people don't realize is how hard that place is physically. Like the screen test are double what it is to get in the buds. That's the bare minimum. Like if you're not... If you're not cranking out 120 push-ups, 140 sit-ups, 30 pull-ups, like you're, you're last. Like if you do the minimums, you're not going. You have to be a freak, um, which was good. We were afforded a lot of time to train and get ready for it and a lot of time in the shoot house, a lot of time shooting, mentally preparing for it. And that was right, um, that was right at the height of like the human performance aspect. So we had a badass strength conditioning coach at group two. Um, that really helped us out. He went over to the Eagles and runs their, their stuff. Um, I mean, so we were ready. Like the crew we had assembled. I mean, that was, that was as prepared as you could have been. Oh shit. So we showed up the first day. I've never been so nervous in my fucking life, dude. I could barely breathe. Um, and I was a freak. I mean, I'm, I say that cocky because I was. Like I was in shape when I showed up. That was the one thing I had going for me is I could pass that screen test. And I'll tell you what, the pressure of that day, I barely got through that fucking thing. It just, 
cranking out 140 push-ups in a single set, like no issue. Now I've got that dude who I want to be like is counting for me and I'm at 70 and I'm blowing snot out of my face. Like, oh my God. Like, I'm just going to try to do these perfect and hopefully he doesn't say anything to me and let's just hope for the best. Like, that's what it was. I mean, it's fucking stressful. And then every day it just continues. I mean, it's all CQB based and, you know, everything else you got to do over there. But um, the pressure to perform, like, you can't have a bad day. Yeah. And it becomes addicting. Like, what would you say got most guys? CQB. CQB. I mean, that's all, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get a couple guys for some other stuff, some jumping, some personality stuff. The officers have a hard time at the end because now it's all the pressure's on them. Um, but, no, man, it's a, it's a humbling experience. What's the pipeline look like? What are the different blocks of training? Um, I mean, not how much I can really get into, but I mean, it's basically, um, if you were to assault a, a target, it's basically what it is. A bunch of CQB, a bunch of shooting, a bunch of jumping, um, you do all the land warfare type stuff, and then it's all the other external stuff you have to do. Do they tie it all together at the end? Yeah. Like a big, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. a couple of exercises? Or... Oh, yeah. Okay. And I mean, it's, it's as real as it could be. Like, it feels real. So what's it like when you... Uh, when you graduate, when you're in? <laughs> um, anticlimactic. Really? Mm-hmm. No tradition? Is there any traditions you can talk about when you make it in? Or um, Yeah, when you get in there. But uh, we, can, we graduated green team. They came in, they read a bunch of names off. And then they said what squadron they were going to and read off a bunch of names. He's like, all right, get in the trucks. That's it? Yeah, we got in the trucks and we went out and we did a, an FMP that night. Big full mission profile. Like, we knew where we were going. And it was like, I, I didn't have a cell phone. I couldn't, couldn't tell my wife. I'm just like, because where I wanted to go was exactly where I went. Um, and I wasn't shy about asking where I wanted to go. <laughs> so, I mean, um, it was like all my dreams had come true. I just finished up green team. Um, well, actually, let's go back. In green team, um, we do a big jump block. I'd already had uh, maybe like 150, 200 skydives before I had my own parachute because I knew what I had to, to be able to do, so I started training on my own. And um, it's in August. We had to do mandatory downwind landings. Um, it's where they want you to run with the wind, so you got a lot of speed coming in. It's to teach you that the parachute doesn't know the difference. If you're going into the wind or downwind, if you do the flare the same, you can manage it. Um, and I hit a divot going hard. Um, I panicked the disco and Cobra struck this thing and I smashed in and I thought I broke my back. I heard a fucking loud pop and my whole right leg went numb and I freaked out and I jumped up real quick and I dusted myself off and I, <sighs> okay, we're good. And I went back in there and I walked over to the corpsman and I told him, I was like, I don't know what the fuck I just did, but it is something bad. He's like, you want to do the x-rays? I was like, no, no. I finished jumping for the rest of the day, and I think that was on a Friday. Um, and I grabbed him, I was like, I gotta do the x-rays right now. Like, we gotta keep this hush-hush. We drove over to the ER, um, we shot x-rays, came back benign. They thought I tore my hip flexor. So I just kept training on it, um, kept jumping. We probably did another 50, 60 jumps on it. Um, and we were doing all the normal stuff. Uh, you know, 10 mile rucks, conditioning runs, buddy carries, we're doing the whole thing. Um, and now it's developed to, I can't lift my leg up. Like I'm dragging this thing now. If I wanted to drive a car, I'd lift it off the gas and put it on the brake. Oh like, shit. Like it's, it's done. And I don't know what it is, but I know I'm not saying anything because I don't want to get rolled. So we finish up jumping and we're about to do, um, we're about to get to the very end. We already know we're going to go and we've got some little bullshit admin block thing we have to do and my legs still messed up and i call back into rehab we start going through the whole thing and he's like let's go in let's get some ct scans let's get an mri and let's see if maybe you broke your back like maybe that's what it is and uh they came back to get me i never forget we were doing the nfl combine um and i was on i think i was on crutches at the time we uh we did the broad jump the vertical max bench press squat deadlift we did a bunch of shit like that a bunch of cone drills and we had just got done and uh they walked in and he's like um 
CMC needs to see you in rehab. I was like, oh, fuck. I walked over there and he's, he's sitting down. He's got a big smile on his face and puts his hand on my knee. He's like, it's going to be okay. And my heart fucking dropped. Like, you could have just shot my fucking puppy. Like, my whole life is over. And um, I looked at the rehab guys who were super fucking awesome. And I was like, what's going on? I was like, back broken? He went, nope. Your hip's broken. Your femoral neck snapped off. He goes, I don't know how the fuck you're walking. And I looked at him and I was like, I think it's my back. And he goes, well, this x-ray right here, this MRI, and they pull it up and you see it. Like femoral neck to ball and socket snapped all the way off. So that impact had broke it and somehow it had relocked in position and it just hadn't sheared. If it had shifted one inch left or right, all the blood supply goes to the hip, it dies. Total hip reconstruction, you're out of the military. Like, Damn. So it's like that. And I looked at him, I've never had surgery. Um, I mean, I've been hurt a lot growing up as a kid. I've broken everything, but I've never had surgery. And he's like, we're gonna have to do emergency surgery. And I looked right at him right in front of that CMC. And I said, there ain't no fucking way, no. And he looked at me and he goes, that's the only option. He's like, you're not deploying. How fast can we do it? And he goes, we can get it done tomorrow at 7 a.m. Let's go. I walked in, they pumped in uh, three titanium uh, five-inch lag bolts through my hip. And I showed up to rehab the next day. And we started physical therapy. We had to finish SEER school. Um, I got a gnarly infection out there. Um, you know, they put you in the box. They played the whole game. It's really well ran. Um, that was actually one of my favorite blocks. Really? It was really well done. Um, it's a different SEER school than one we did. Um, it was really well ran. I learned a lot about that school, but I got a nasty infection. So I had this wound on the side of my hip. I could press on my thigh and blow pus out of it. I mean, it was bad. Like they were doing pick lines in my arms. It was, it was bad. <laughs> and um, my body started rejecting the screws. I didn't know how bad it was going to be, but I knew that I had to deploy soon. So we're coming up on the new year and we're supposed to deploy. Um, they were going to let us have Christmas there and then we're going to deploy in January. So made it through green team, got a broken hip. I think we had surgery in end of November and I'm going to deploy in January. Fuck. And they're saying it's a, a four to six month recovery time. Um, I, I heal superhuman. I was even faster back then. Um, and those guys, they're not dumb, man. We, uh, we do vitamin D3, we do calcium, all the supplements to try to get that bone to grow as fast. I quit dipping. <laughs> I started right back up after I healed, but yeah, I quit anything to try to get myself in the best position to deploy. And I still was, and I still wasn't cleared. So the rehab guy, so badass, he deployed with me. I met over there and he stayed for like two or three weeks and we did physical therapy there and I tested out um, in Afghanistan. They, f they flew a fucking rehab specialist, mm -hmm. physical therapist with you on deployment. I don't know if we, we had a, one of those huge box jumps, like one of the ones that's like waist high. And the final test was I had to put on all my gear and I had to do a depth jump off of that and land on one leg. <laughs> and I never forget, I looked at him, um, I looked him right in the fucking eyes and I was like, Mike, I don't know about this one, brother. And he went, if you're not sure, don't do it. And I stepped off and it fucking hurt. It hurt bad. And he went, how do you feel? And I went, 100%. And he went, okay. He signed me off and we started going. Um, yeah, man. Fucking hey. Cleared out and had a good deployment. Um, it was a half one. It was probably two or three months long because um, I caught you know the half of it with all the guys who graduated green team with and then came back and kind of geared up for the next one, just the constant rotation. So you... You've been through three Iraq deployments before you did your first deployment with uh, Dev Group. Yeah. And they were all pretty eventful deployments. Yep. How did that first deployment compare to your other three? Um, Especially your second. That one was okay um, because we were new guys and it wasn't my element. I was attached to it. Um, the team that I was supposed to go to was doing some other shit that wasn't really conducive for new guys to be there. Um, it was more like an older senior position. Um, we were kind of doing the outstation thing. So they didn't want us to get bogged down with that. So we got to stay with the strike force. Um, and it was cool, we got to do a bunch of stuff. Um, we, were, uh, we were battling um, kind of a weather cycle, just the way it did. So 
not as super busy as it was, but we turned right back around the next year and that was um, 11 into 12 and then it was good. Wow. So it was good. It was, uh, it was humbling just to see, God, I hate to say how nonchalant, but just nothing raised them. Like they'd go out and whatever would happen and it would be like, holy shit. It wouldn't even get debriefed. But, <laughs> like it was so, um, it was so effortless to watch the move. It was, I mean, it's like watching Gretzky take the fucking ice. Like, oh my God. Like that's what, that's norm. So, so you know, what do you mean by that? Do you mean there's no buildup? No, like I mean, it's just, it's that even keel all the way through they are, man, pre-op like, on the op post-op. It's just it's, even keel. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter what happened. It professional, like that's the way it's supposed to be done. And then you saw it and then it all started to click. That's why, that's why, that's why it's to achieve that to where, I mean, <laughs> one of the guys, um, I mean, I, one of the guys who was out there, uh, did some pretty amazing shit on it, on one of these fucking things. And, uh, I made a comment during the debrief, like, are we not going to address that? And, uh, I'll never forget, dude. He looked right at me almost with, uh, a little bit of snap. And he's like, can you get in the end zone? Act like you've been there before and walked away. And that was the, that was the tone. Like, don't pound your chest. It doesn't matter. You got to prove it again in five hours. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. It was like the, the level of proficiency was so fucking high that it was like, you were just, you're just in a constant run to maintain. It's, it's humbling, man. Like to watch it at the finest. It was, uh, it was everything I ever wanted to see. Yeah, I mean, it's like growing up playing baseball your entire life and you finally get to go watch the Yankees play. Like you're in the dugout with them. You get to see them. You get to touch them. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's like my entire life was nothing but SEAL team. That was it. Yeah. That's all I ever known. Now I get to see it at the highest level. It's... I mean, dude, it gives me goosebumps, man. Like, to see it that good. You're like, holy shit. I had no idea. Because you get stuck in a, get stuck not in a falsehood, but um, the standard becomes the standard until someone exceeds it. And when the collective exceeds it, it became a dynasty. Like, I can't believe how good it was. Looking back on it now, like, that's as close to perfection as I've ever seen it. And it was the norm. Like, no chest pounding, just go. Like, humbling. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Especially, I mean, they really set the tone. It sounds like when you, when you get through Green Team, and they're just, yep, Shipley here, so and so here, yeah, get in the fucking truck. Yeah, you know? damn man. So, makes uh makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But, all right, let's take uh let's take a quick break, and then when we get back, we'll get into uh when you're a specific deployment you were on. So we're back. You're, we're getting into some deployments, but I wanted to bring something up, breathing through your timeline. You know, first deployment in the SEAL teams, you get in, biggest loss in SEAL team history happens. Then you get through green team, and right after you graduate, what, maybe six, less than a year afterwards. Yeah, I mean, August of, uh, August of 11. Extortion 17 happens, which again, is the biggest loss in SEAL team history. So let's start there. Um, kind of the way we talk about it is where were you? Where were you when 9-11 happened? Yeah. Where were you when June 28th happened? And where were you when August 6th happened? I know exactly where I was. I was sitting in a, a movie theater with my wife sitting next to me, my shooting buddy's wife, and then my shooting buddy. We're all watching a movie. And we're probably 45 minutes into it. And 
phone goes off and you're glued to these things. Um, can't miss a text message. Like, I mean, the addiction to, the addiction to your phone becomes a real thing. Like you can't miss a text message. You can't miss a phone call ever. Um, and his phone goes off and mine does too. When we both crack him, and we both look at each other at the same time. And he had got a text from somebody in the white house, um, a staffer used to be a team guy. And he said, call me right now. And I had the exact same thing, the exact same time that said, call me right now from a different guy. Okay. And he texts back, what's up? And, uh, he said, Afghanistan, he will get to work. I like to write at my old lady, get up, walked right out of that movie. They split and drove each other home and I jumped in the car with him. We drove straight to work and everybody was in there. Like it was spreading fast. Um, nobody had any real details. I mean, we did, but, um, it went into, um, it turned into a fucking circus. It was like, I was reliving a movie that I already seen that I didn't want to know the ending of. Um, I've been here before. Like I already knew what this is. All the notifications, basically everybody's throwing on dress blues or driving out. Um, me and my wife are grabbing groceries and gallons of Starbucks and dropping off at Gold Star houses. Um, just really trying to take care of our own. Um, that's one good thing about the Gold Star community is they know exactly what they need. So basically the notification team would go out and then we would roll in behind and drop off gifts, um, you know, groceries. We pick up kids from, from school. We do whatever we could. Um, and that's the collective. That's everybody. It's just what you did. Trying to make sense of what had actually happened. Um, there's just no good way to, there's just no good way to go about that. I mean, that loss is felt this fucking moment. Like that didn't happen. That how did this happen again? Um, and you couldn't explain why. I mean, things happen in war, things that you wish didn't happen. You wish it wasn't a reality. And it's absolutely reality. It's another reality check doesn't matter how good those dudes were. You couldn't have picked a better... There wasn't a more capable fighting force on the fucking earth than the dudes were on that helicopter. And it didn't matter. It did not matter. Gone in an instant. It's like, fuck. Like, how are you going to come back from that? And then selfishly, how are we going to take care of all these families? Like, what do we do now? It's like every foundation just dumped in, trying to support, trying to do whatever they could to... I mean, inside of that, we're trying to rebuild. Like, we still have, we're still fighting the GWAT. Like, we can't let this be our defining moment. We just can't. We've been through this thing before. Um, unfortunately, the the CEO at the time had been through, had been through this exact same thing. He was a Group Two Commodore when Red Wings happened. And he had been through this whole fucking thing. So, put a plan in action. We had to rebuild the force. Had to take care of all the families. Um, take care of all the kids. Me and Patsy started making a um, memorial t-shirts, um, within 12 hours. Um, just trying to raise money, just trying to do anything. That's what a lot of people don't realize is, uh, there's a, there's a gap. Like if you're pronounced dead, your paycheck stops. There's a long gap before any kind of life insurance comes in or any kind of support. So the only thing that puts food on the table, the only thing that puts gas in the car is their foundations. Like people that are raising money, um, and we don't know how long that gap's gonna be. Like now we've got you know, big name foundations that really lend a helping hand, but it doesn't matter. To them, to that singular family, the whole world just came crashing down, it's over. Like it'll never fucking be okay now. It's like anything you can do to try to lighten that burden, you try to. That's making a memorial t-shirt, that's you know, picking up the kids and having to make skateboards, whatever it might be, you have to do something. Um, But I'll tell you what, that was, um, that was a super dose of reality because doing a lot of shit in helos and it's like, that's the reality. That is exactly what is going to happen. Like there's nothing you can do for that. It doesn't matter. Like you can't plan for that. You just can't. I mean, you can, you can try to do things, but a helo gets shot down with all those people on board. There's no good scenario out of that. Um, and it crippled us. We had to rebuild the force and Every team had to give up bodies. Um, and that was the whole point of contention. Like 
people wanting to rebuild, people not wanting to rebuild. Um, I don't want to go. I want to go. Just it was a it was a circus there for a couple of weeks. It was. Um, Do you want to describe a little bit more in detail how many lost, what happened? Well, without getting many specifics, uh, the weather was not in favor. Um, it was a high loom night, um, and a force went out and got contacted and needed to launch a QRF. And they launched in that troop to be a QRF, and on final they got shot down. Um, everybody's in there, like, you've got an amazing force, you've got the world's best sitting in the back of this flying school bus. It lands down, they shoot it out of the sky. It's, um, you just can't plan for it. I mean, you just can't. It's 31 people gone, including some Afghan partner forces, but an entire troop of people. Yeah. It's just gone. And I mean, things that people don't think about, things that I know that haunt other individuals is, um, think about the guy who missed that deployment, had a shoulder surgery and wasn't there. Think about the guy who had to go home for a birth of his kid. You should have been there. Like, that's going to weigh on that dude forever. And it is. Um, I don't know. I just remember walking into the building and it being so fucking somber. Just, um, you didn't know where the smile, like, you wanted to have fun at work, but you couldn't. Like, how dare you smile right now? It was one of those things, like, um, and it wasn't a forced, um, it wasn't a forced thing. It's just, it's what it was. I mean, we were in the trenches for a long fucking time, man. We just were. And uh, it felt like it was so hard to get back out of it. We tried to rebuild and we've got the force and they're back and they're, I mean, they dumped every dude. They pull guys from all the other teams and try to rebuild that one troop and they grabbed some fucking all-stars, man. They did. Like they spared no expense. They grabbed some serious fucking talent and they rebuilt um, and they built a dynasty. Like they built some fucking badass dudes. Um, and it was like one thing after another. So we get them all back up and that's 2011. Um, so I had Nick check in my team. We were in the same five man team and he got pulled out to go over there to backfill and all the guys got killed in extortion. Um, and it didn't feel right. It didn't seem right. Um, him and my wife were really tight. Um, we did our first uh, platoons together. And when he went over, um, I rolled into his team as a new guy. Um, and I fucking loved him, man. God, he was awesome. He just was. He was, uh, he was everything you wanted a teammate. Um, he came over and retiled my entire kitchen, him and my wife, when I was on deployment, before his first deployment with the command. Up until the last hour, he drove to the command covered in tile soot and put on fresh clothes and got on the plane. Damn. Like, fucking great dude. And, uh, you know, we just came back from, uh, we just came back from Afghanistan deployment in between extortion. Um, so we backfilled them, had to sleep in their beds, had to do that whole thing. That's a very sombering, sombering thing to have to do. Um, I mean, it's the reality. Like, this is what it is. Sleep in a dead guy's bed. So, um, just another reality check. Trying to get in there and hit a really good target set and everything's great and we're, we're going to work. It's all steady in the back of your mind. It's like, any moment here, any moment this thing's going to get us. And it almost did a couple times. The exact same thing. I mean, we took RPGs off the refueler. Um, getting shot on infill, exfill, I mean, just close ones. Yeah. Um, testament to the pilot's capabilities, just how good they were. Um, but right after that, um, that was a really good deployment. Like, that was probably my favorite deployment um, because of the people we were with, like that team. God, man, I, uh, I did not deserve to be in that team. <laughs> um, I fucking love that. If you could have, uh, if you could have locked me in a time capsule, I'd still be in there. I would have never came home. I loved it so much. I had separated myself from everything outside of that. Um, and it was the only thing that made me feel normal was being there. I, I loved it. I loved the banter. I loved the shit talking. I loved the pranks. Um, 
I love the professionalism. I love the absolute obsession to the detail. I loved it. Um, and to watch those guys work, um, it's hard so to So were you intermixed with the team that took the loss? Nope. Or was this, okay. This is after. Um, right. We just rolled base in the same, kind of like you guys uh, on June 28th. All right. You guys rolled in, same thing. Okay. At the same so base. You, you relieved them. Yep. All right. Um, it was uh, it was weird, man. Just the whole thing was dicey, and we came back, kind of like my mentor at that point, like my my true north was my team leader. Then he, um, his wife is best friends with Patsy. I'm best friends with him. He's a groom's in my wedding. I knew him before. I screened and all that. I fucking loved him. Um, and he got hurt, got medically retired after that deployment. Um, our number two did. Three or four other guys got fucked up pretty bad. Um, and it just, I hate to say I had all my eggs in one basket, but I, I love being in that team so much. The energy, the collective. Um, I was not, I was not ready to lose that. I wasn't. And when he was going to medically retire, he fucking crushed me. Is this, okay, never um, mind. Yep. Keep going. So it crushed me. It was like, that's who I want to be. This is a whole team. Like, if we can just freeze this shit, like, everybody will re-enlist. We'll just stay here. It was amazing. We came back from that deployment. We're kind of rebuilding. He's moving out. We've got new guys coming in. Everything's good. Um, and Nick Check deploys. He deploys out. Um, I'll never forget, man. I'm, uh, I'm sitting with my wife at Yard House. I've got both my uncles. Um, so I come from a long military background. Um, on my dad's side, I've got him. My grandfather was a fighter pilot, U.S. Air, um, um, US Airways pilot after that. My other uncle was 75th Ranger Regiment, jumped into Panama and did 25 years in the Secret Service, counter sniper team. My other one was a Marine, uh, um, was a Marine infantry guy. So I'm sitting across my two uncles. We're having an honest conversation and my phone goes off. Um, and it's one of the guys from the team. Like, we're not doing anything. We're just, we're in Virginia Beach hanging out. And, and I grab it. Um, I was like, hey, what's up? He's like, walk outside real quick. And bebop outside. And his car's driving by. I'm like, plug in one ear. I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, you sitting down? No. Should I be? And there's a long pause. Um, fuck, man. <laughs> uh, so there's a long pause. And he said, Nick got shot. And I waited. I said, okay, where is he and when do we need to go pick him up? Is he no longer pause? And I can feel it. I can feel it building up inside me. It feels like it's resting on my fucking sternum. It's about to come out of my fucking mouth and I don't know what it is, but, but it's something. And uh, in the shakiest fucking voice he could muster, he said, he's gone. And I, uh, I let out a whimper. I let out something. I started fucking bawling. I, I'll be in work in 15 minutes. I hung up the phone. I dried my eyes real quick. I'm like, I'm going to walk in there. I'm going to sit down at this fucking booth. I'm going to eat my Kung Pao chicken. I'm going to drink this Moscow mule. And I'm going to get through dinner and then I'm going to drive to work and I'll, I'll tell Patsy tomorrow. Like, I mean, she loved Nick. She fucking loved him. Um, and I sat down and I stared right in between my uncles. I picked a spot on the wall and I stared there. And they're all looking at me. I can feel it. And she put her hand on my shoulder and I looked over at the corner of my eye and she said, tell me. And I fucking, I fucking lost it. Oh. It, uh, fuck man. Do you want to talk about what he was doing? He was doing a hostage rescue for a uh, doctor named Dillard Joseph. In Afghanistan. Um, bad scenario. Obviously, Ed Byers got the Medal of Honor. Um, there were a bunch of Navy crosses that came out of that op. Um, but long story short, they uh, they patrolled up um, Nick's walking point, and one of the sentries came out, and they had a brief engagement. Um, and he ran up to make a dynamic entry super fast. Like, the gig's up, we have to go. So he closed the distance, and um, they had a bunch of blankets in the doorway. 
He's clearing the blankets, trying to get inside, and as he makes entry, he takes a round. Um, kind of over. The rest is history. Guys came in, killed all the bad guys, saved all the good guys. Um, you know, I talked to the guys that, that worked on him. Um, you know, the only positive um, out of the whole fucking thing is they got the hostage. That's why you sign. That's why you go there, is to do that mission only. Um, and to know that you gave your last breath trying to save another human. You know, that's exactly who he is. Um, so it's an honor to know him. Um, but fuck, man, I did not want him to go. Was that your hardest loss? Probably. I um I didn't even process it. I didn't. I um I stonewalled that shit. I fucking threw up a wall so fucking thick. I did. And about five days later I ran all the uh, all the swag, so all the all the t shirts and the hats. I made the shadow boxes. I did the, the going away shit and I had to go make his shadow box. And uh I had all his awards, had all his shit, all the patches, uh, all the stuff we were gonna put inside of uh inside his shadow box and I walked into John Will's studio, same guy that made all your deployment plaques. And I walked in, I got a really good relationship with him and all the ladies that work in there. And I walked in um, and his number two lifted her head up from the office, walked out and saw me. And I was totally normal, just like this. And she went, I am so sorry. And she said it. I haven't cried like that. Probably ever. That was probably it. Um, I dropped my fucking knees, man. I was dry even. He was such a good fucking dude. He was so talented, and he trained all the fucking time. And he was, you couldn't have you couldn't have done better. And the reality, he was gone. Um, I wasn't ready for it. I tried to wall it up, try to pretend like it didn't happen. And then I tried to make excuses. Like, why did that happen to him? And then I had to justify it to Patsy. Why that's not gonna happen to me. It's like, well, I've gotta cut out more negative shit. I've gotta cut out everything. I've gotta completely obsess now. Like, this is what I have to do now. And it just justified it. Like, we're playing for fucking keeps, man. I'm like, it became another thing that I'd slide in there. Like. You know, you want me to spend more time at home? You want me to do this? I have to obsess. This is fucking for real. If I have a bad day at the office, that's what happens. Being that Patsy was a gold star wife and her previous husband, you know, died, uh, killed in combat, do you, were you able to lean on her a little bit more? Was she, uh, like, could you relate? Oh yeah, to her a lot more than most yeah. guys could relate with their wives, and I mean, yeah, and especially because you know, because I grew up in the teams, I grew up in it. I felt like, I felt like I was as much part of that community as anything else. Um, and yeah, we leaned heavy on each other, and a lot of it was. She convinced me it was okay. She's like, DJ, that dude loved everything he fucking did. He loved it. There's no, there's nothing else that dude would have done. If you would have given him an option of dying at 80 in a fucking bed alone or dying on that, he would have picked that. That's just the dude he was. Like, he doesn't want you to be here depressed, mourning him all day. He wants you to go fucking get it on. That's what he wants. He wants you to go back to fucking work and be as good as you can. Fair enough. And the obsession continued. It's like, I wasn't in touch with myself. I didn't know anything about grief. Um, I just, I, I walled it up. I did. We stopped talking about it. We made, uh, we made shrines for him. We made memorial patches. Um, we did everything. Um, but I had to go do the notification and knock at his door for his fiance at the time. Dude, I don't know how people do that. But uh, I can remember every detail of that. It was fucking terrible. We all met at my house. Um, 
at 7 a.m. Had me, um, Will Chesney, um, and one of the guys um, who was on Nick's new team, who's an ops chief. We all met at my house. Patsy was there. She kind of gave us a brief on kind of what to expect because um, we've done notifications before for August 6th, but you never know. So, you know, we kind of pow out it like, hey, who, who's ringing the doorbell? Who's saying this? We're all in dress blues. And it started pissing down rain. Um, it like torrential downpour. In our shoes, you know, we wear the black core frame dress shoes. It was so hot in Virginia Beach when extortion happened from sitting on the tarmac, it had melted all our shoes. It melted the heels off. So when we got out of the car and we took a step, all the heels blew off our core frames. And Nick Jack is a neat freak. He's OCD. He's got white fucking carpet. So I get out. I've got Patsy in the car behind us. She's got uh, groceries. She's got Starbucks. She's got a bunch of shit. Just uh, like you're not leaving the house for 48 hours. Here, like this will this will tide you over until we can figure out what we're going to do. Because um, if you're not a wife, it's kind of a weird, you know, predicament you're in. Um, so it's really like we had to take care of her. Notification teams went out to the families and all that. But I remember ringing that doorbell and hearing her upstairs directly above the front door. I remember hearing her walk down the stairs, turning the corner. And as it got closer and closer, the footsteps got louder and louder. Um, and I was on a fucking breath, old man. I did not want that door to open. I was hoping she wouldn't answer it. I was hoping we get turned around and somebody else would have to do that. And uh, throw bolt flips. Door knob opens, slowly starts to crack, and as soon as she fucking saw us, she knew. She didn't cry. She just looked at me, kind of cocked her head, and like, she knew me. Tell me. And I fucking came and I gave her a big hug and fucking bawling. <laughs> um, and I told her. We had a, a very, um, very um, no bullshit conversation about what's going to happen over the next 72 hours. Um, kind of everything we need to to get done. Um, and we kind of just went from there. Like, you got to go buy a fucking dress. You got to go buy this. You got to get this right now. Like, these are all the things that has to happen. Um, and you've got about 12 hours because this thing's going to go and you're not going to have time. So whatever you need, let's get on it right now. Um, I remember her making a comment on the black uh, shoe marks. We track black shit all throughout his house. And she's like, God, you're lucky he's dead or he'd fucking kill you. <laughs> we all started laughing, like, no doubt. We Stanley Steam over there, we're vacuuming the carpets and shit. Um, we all drove up to DC together. We uh, That was the coolest thing. Um, drove there and picked him up. Um, same thing we did for the guys at Extortion. We all drove up there in unison, um, met all the planes and did all that. And she drove up there with us. It was, uh, oh, fuck, man. Just, <laughs> It's like one of those things you just wanted to be over and you didn't because now you have to do the memorial. Now you have to get up and speak. Now you have to go through all your photo albums and pick all the photos you like. They have to put it to a montage and you have to watch it over and over and over. Now the family starts to fly and you got to meet all of them. Like it just, it never ends. It felt like that, that process was five years long. Like I was fucking crippled at the end of that one. Um, I just was. I was in a fucking bad spot. Um, some key people in um, the organization were shifting out. They were retiring. They were getting medically retired. And um, I felt a void. I did. With him being gone, it, um, it really felt a void. That takes us to 2013. So I think that transition from, um, from Nick dying until basically the rest of the career, I, um, confirmation bias. Hmm. Everything I had ever said, everything I had ever told Patsy was coming true. Everything. Um, I used to tell her things, um, cause I'd obsess. Um, I bet you, uh, in my entire time in the teams, I bet you I went into that building every day. I've been in Virginia beach minus 25. Every Saturday and Sunday, I'd go through there just to show face to make sure my cage was still there. Like I had to touch the magic every fucking day to make sure it was real. Yeah. I had to. I, I was fucking obsessed. But it was good because everybody else with me was just obsessed. 
but I'd justify it to her. Um, I'd start to separate myself from her, um, separate myself from different friends outside of the organization. Just, it was a linear focus. This is it. This is the only thing that fucking matters. There's no distractions. And it reminded me of my childhood. Um, the only thing that matters is the team. Like, dad's got to go on deployment. You can't do this because of that. Like, you can't do this because it'll affect deployment. I can't get shoulder surgery because I need to go on deployment. I can't do this because of that. We can't take a vacation because of this. And I self-justified it. Um, I was like, no one's going to die if I'm a 65% husband. No one. Like, I'll be a husband when I retire. Would you change anything looking back now, <sighs> doing that? Yes and no. Um, what would you change? I would have retired sooner. They tried to retire me in 2014. Um, I wish I would have let them. I was in such a fucking bad spot, man. I just, um, I let it take me. I let it take me. Um, I don't regret it. Some days I do. But um, I thought it needed it. I thought, um, I thought it was a worthy cause, man. Everything we did. Um, all the training, the late nights, the early mornings, um, it gave you a, it gave you a purpose. It did. It gave you the why. And it became very easy to just judge people. Like you don't work out, you don't shoot, you don't care. You're not a professional. You don't want to do this. Like get the fuck away from me. I'm going to surround myself with these dudes because they only give a shit. This is the only thing that matters. And it became addictive. It did because you got to see the performance. You got to feel it. Like, I mean, it's a measurable thing. Like I started here and I ended here. And I only did that because I didn't let anything else distract me. There's no skateboarding. There's no snowboard trips for me. I couldn't justify it. I couldn't justify breaking my wrist and missing deployment. I couldn't justify wakeboarding and blowing out an ACL. I couldn't justify it. I could justify the skydiving thing because it's part of work. I couldn't justify anything else. I couldn't justify drinking. You fucking drink. Two drinks in a single sitting? Like, I haven't been drunk since 2010. Wow. I don't do it. Like, can I safely operate a vehicle? Can I speak to the police? Can I discharge a firearm? Can I provide life saving medical aid? If the answer is yes, then I'm good to go. If I'm shit faced, I can't do any of those. That's the metric. If I can't articulate my speech to a police officer to get you out of a fucking jam, I've gone too far. I pull up on a the car wreck on the side of the road. I gotta save him. I'm like, am I shit faced? And that's why I blow past him because I'm afraid I'll get a DUI? That's not an answer. That's not a professional answer. The answer is I don't have to worry about that because I'm professional. I'm not drunk. I'm professional. I don't need to put booze in my system. I don't need to be shit faced at 2 30 in the morning. That doesn't make the group better. Yeah. The group before the individual became the standard. And fuck, man, it made, it made life so much easier. Does what you're doing now make the group better? No. Then why are you doing it? True. Negative people in your life? Static, whatever. Does that what, make you better? What were you doing to cope then? Because a lot of people, you know, they cope with booze. They cope with drugs. They cope, you know, all kinds of ways to cope. You had to be coping somehow. So, after I broke that hip, um, got on some painkillers. Um, so long story short, I, I blew out that hip. Um, I rushed rehab. I did. And the way they put those screws in, um, they lifted my IT band on the side of your leg and pumped in the screws, laid the IT band back. And we did that 20, uh, that 2012 deployment. I had a, I had a pretty bad fall down the side of a mountain and, uh, those screws came out and they blew through my IT band. Um, had to do another surgery. Like it was bad. Um, and the rehab that came after that, it's on painkillers and I needed to be on them. Um, had a bunch of surgeries that I needed to get and I was just, I was held together with, you know, rigor staving, chewing gum. Like I was, I was banged up, man. And, um, uh, started eating some tramadol and everything else. And it just, it became the norm. Like I wasn't high. I just, I didn't want to feel the way I felt. Like I'd wake yeah. up in the morning. It's like. I feel like this at 32. Holy shit. You're just numb to it. Yeah. You're just How numb. much tramadol were you taking, you know? A shit ton. 
I mean, I eat them in 300 milligrams a pop. Like, oh, bad. Oh, I eat a shit ton. Several yeah. a day. Oh, yeah. But it's like, I didn't realize what it was doing because it wasn't a, it wasn't a narcotic. You couldn't be addicted to it. Bullshit. Yeah. You get addicted to not feeling pain. That's what you get addicted to. Um, and I didn't realize it, but that continued from essentially 10 until... When I retired, like 18, um, yeah. I rode that train for a while, tram it all. And, uh, I'm just curious, how did you know, how did you know it was an issue? What, what happened with me personally? I know it was an issue when I ran out and I felt what, what that felt like without having any. And, uh, that fucking hurts. Mm -hmm. Is that? Um, yeah. Um, so I had just came back from a deployment. Um, into a nasty firefight. A bad one. Um, a lot of really close proximity shit. Ate a bunch of grenades. Um, the long and short of it was, um, because of the proximity to it, we had to use some breaching charges and some ordnance essentially on top of yourself um, to get out of this certain situation. And it fucked us up, man. Like, no eye pro, no ear pro. I mean, grenades landing between me and you. Boom. Just a, a cumulative effect. These little concussions that blew out both ears. Um, oh, man. I mean, just... <laughs> um, by the by the end of it, um, I've blown out both ears. I've torn both labrums and both shoulders, both hip labrums. Gone. Um crunched a bunch of shit in my lower back and my neck. So I needed to have surgery on both shoulders and both hips and my back by the time the whole thing was done. And I didn't realize how bad it was. <sighs> Fuck, I don't know. Do we get into it? Do we talk about the... Okay. No, let's get into it. Okay, fuck it. <laughs> we, uh... So the backside of this is we had a dude, um that did the, the Kenya mall attack. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So it's that dude. Um, so it's around the Horn of Africa and we are going to go get this dude. It's a president directed mission. So it's a big one. Um, the biggest one that I've ever done for sure. Um, Intel's painting, uh, paint a picture that's maybe not accurate. Beachside bungalow. Like he goes there to watch TV, hang out, be super benign in and out. Cool. Not the fucking case. We get there, we've planned, we've rehearsed, and we've done all our shit. And I, um, I'm running the primary breach on the first floor. I go up and over the gate. I should probably start off with, uh, we swam in. So that's a whole different set of problems. Um, we swam in a, uh, a slaughterhouse offshoot. Um, so you can imagine all the great white sharks. That's a real fucking thing. Um, that's the fastest I ever swam in my life. <laughs> so we swam in, we do our whole thing. I go up and over, um, and I'm messing around with the locking mechanism on the gate to try to get it open. And there's a string going from the gate. It looks like it's going inside. Um, and now I think that was a, an early warning device. Um, I think it was hooked to a bell. It was hooked to something. Um, we get the gate open, we bring everybody in, and as we are rolling up to the front door, they start getting contact on the roof. Guy comes out, shoots, skips off one of the guy's helmet, and now the firefighting suits. And it's three stories, and it's getting fucking chaotic, dude. Like, they have been prepping for this for a long fucking time, and this is not a beachside bungalow. There's, uh, there's no doors. They're all walled up from the inside. There's nothing to attack, you can't see anything. It's like I'm trying to get the door open, but you don't know where the hinges are. You don't know what it is. It's this huge, um, super thick door. Fuck, man. It probably must have been six inches thick. So it's a fucking fortress. It's a fucking fortress, dude. It's a fucking, it's a literal fortress. Um, they start getting contact on the roof, and we sprint up the front door. And as we go to divide, this dude opens up on the front door and lets it go. And just you just see splinters of wood, and it just fucking traces us and doesn't hit anybody. 
we rolled it either side and now we're trying to deal with this problem. Um, the hate coming out of that front door was nothing like I've ever seen. It just continuous ascending it. And the way it, it ended up being was a long wall, the door in the center. I'm on one side and I've got um, my shooting buddy on the other side and I've got my team leader behind me. And we're trying to figure this out. Like we have to get inside but we're not supposed to kill this dude. That was the whole thing, is for whatever reason, the powers to be really wanted this dude alive, and the last thing they told us before we went, I, I would rather you shoot him a hundred times and he lives than shoot him one time and he dies. Bring him back alive. Well, I'm fucking committed. We all are. We're gonna bring that dude back alive. We came up with every plan we could have, um, and at the end of the day, if you don't wanna be captured, you're not capturing the dude. You're just not. Um, especially in that part of the world, which is how violent they are. I mean, you've seen Black Hawk Down. That's the most realistic war movie I've ever fucking watched. That's exactly how it is. They are fucking, <laughs> and they come on quick. So we're in this, we're in this shit storm in the middle of the door. <laughs> and I'm trying to decide how I'm going to blow this thing. I've got my charge in my hand. It's already capped in. Um, I've got my hydrogel peeled. I'm ready to stick this thing, and I'm timing between his bursts coming through the door. So you see it all chew up. Like three, two, wham, goes live again. You're like, motherfucker, man. You're just timing it. He finally goes, and I slap this thing, and there's nowhere to roll. There's just nothing to do. Um, you got to eat it. It's like, luckily for me, the guy behind me is super experienced. Um, I mean, we all are very experienced breachers, and we knew we could take it. We'd been there before. Um, just unfortunate. Turn your head and exhale and send it. And uh, that concussion blew out the, everybody's ears. We were all done. Um, and when it blew, I could see the locking mechanism behind it. Was, it looked like a fucking railroad tie was stuck yeah. down. So big New York lock and we weren't getting through it. But it blew out a slat about waist high down, about this wide. Um, and grenades started coming out of it. <laughs> Accurate. So the way it was, it's the front door and there's a long ass hallway going down. And there's a dude who's in a sandbag position with a belt fed at the end of the hallway. And it's just chewing down the hallway. And there's a dude in the first room off to the right who's shooting at us through the window. So I've got my shooting buddy pinned. He's taking fire over this shoulder. And he's taking fire down the hallway and he can't move. He can't do anything. It's like a big railing. We've got all the rest of the guys on. So we're the only three that are stuck on there. We're trying to get this door open. Um, let me back up. When I place the charge, I roll back and I look at him and I was like, turning steel. And I turned my head and I blew it. And when I looked back up, he was gone. And I looked down and I saw the hole and I thought he went. And I dropped to my knees and I start going for the door and my team leader's pulling me back. I guess he had jumped over the wall. Um, I thought he went. And I was not gonna let that fucking dude go alone. <laughs> I'm on my hands and knees trying to crawl through this fucking hole. And uh, he's pulling me back. Like, we're good. We're good. Well, now we can't get out. Um, this thing's been going on for a couple minutes. The guys on the second deck are in the same shit storm. The guys on the roof are in the exact same thing. Now there's people that are surrounding us. We're taking fire from. The whole thing's getting dicey. Um, and we've got to fucking leave. Like, we can't sit here and do this for another 10 more minutes. Like, you're not going to let us kill this guy. We can. We've got to get out. Unfortunately for us, the only egress route was directly behind us which is directly in line with that dude's PK. So the only way out is to run straight through his alley. Can't go up and over the walls. There's not enough time. We don't have enough ladders. And there's quite a few guys inside the courtyard. Um, we're trading grenades back and forth with this dude. And it finally comes time. The enemy QRF is upon us. And they're in technicals heading our way. And we got to fucking go. So look at the TL. What do you want, man? He's like, get ready for an RPG. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I mean, like, bells already rang. Like, we've got shit coming out of our nose. Like, we're, we're super concussed. Um, and we ate a, for the guys that know, I mean, we ate a 1,200-grain ECT from arm's length away. Jesus. No ear pro. I mean, we just sent it. I mean, I know what that charge is going to do. The overpressure is going to fuck me up, but it's not going to blow me up. I know what that charge will do and what it won't. And I was confident in it. Um, and we had to send it. There was no other way. I wasn't going to turn around and leave without giving it every, every bit of effort I could. And I looked back at him and I don't know how the fuck we're going to get out of here. It's like, get a T-bomb. Like, 
So my buddy was uh, down in the courtyard. He had a T-bomb because we had to swim in a bunch of this shit. So we had spread loaded a bunch of stuff. Um, so I'd already launched one in and I looked at him and we did a, we did a real world flea flicker, which is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> fucking threw it across the doorway, caught it, untaped it and launched it. Um, but it was funny. It was so funny to see uh, the TL. He's like pushing on the walls. He's like doing the, doing the, the math in his head, like this many square, square feet, the concussion, this overpressure, what's it going to do to us? And um, we launched it. We sent a bunch of rounds down there and basically called for exfil. Like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to let this thing loose, um, this overpressure charge. And then when it goes boom, we're all going to take off and run. And that's what we did. Um, and I'm doing the peekaboo thing. He's shooting. I'm trying to see where he is. And I finally see it. And I've got that T-bomb. I'm like, you ready? Pull the pin. And I launched the most beautiful toss I've ever had. And uh, when I turned, the overpressure was so bad, it blew me off the porch. And we took off at a dead run as fast as we could go. Had a big, uh, <laughs> a big guy there blow through the gate. We didn't even open the gate. Everybody came up and over. That's how... It was taking too long. We didn't have time to fuck with it. So he shouldered the gate and blew through it. That's how we got out. And that dude never skipped a beat firing that PK. Never. Wow. Like I am I threw a T-bomb, essentially what I thought, in that dude's lap. Nothing. Fuh, 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 fuh. Continued. I don't know how he didn't shoot us. I don't know how he didn't. Shot one of the recce guys off the ladder, um, like chewing up the wall that he was on. I mean, fucking crazy. Just the continuous hate that was coming out of the thing. Um. We made it back down. We got a quick head count. We had everybody there. The the enemy's massing, um, and we got to get the fuck out. Um, and the surf was shitty. So the extract platform, long story short, gets rolled over in the surf zone. So now this whole thing, um, it happens in, on Xville, um, just in the, in the confusion and everything else, just trying to get boats in alignment. And, uh, I mean, we had dudes get not left out at sea, but basically like this is such a shit show right now and it is so fucking dangerous we're just going to swim as far as we can we turn on an iris strobe and we just swam got picked up by um bunches of um exfil platforms and everything else but in the course of that um essentially the only way to get out is i <laughs> grabbed a hold of the bow line and i wrapped it around my my wrist and i had them tow me out on a zodiac and when they picked up enough speed the wake it spun me and it popped my shoulder so now my arm is it's essentially paralyzed. Um, like, it's not working. It's like, holy fuck. I do the exact same thing, and I wrap it up with this one. The same thing. Pow. <laughs> like, oh, my God. No, I'm treading water. Like, I've, I've got use of my arms, but it feels like um, it feels like it dislocated. Like, it feels strange. Um, an exorbitant amount of pain. We get on a, uh, on a jet ski, round two. And that thing flips. And because we're straddling it, the way it flipped with such force, it blew out this, um, blew out the, uh, the label of my right hip and my left hip. So now I'm essentially bobbing like a bag of shit. Jesus Christ. Um, so me and my swim buddy, we make it out. We get on there. We, we do our debrief. They're, they strip us down naked. Um, with all those frags that we ate, everything, none of the frags stuck in us. I mean, we were super concussed. We were fucked up. But you could brush it, and it was like a, like metal shavings everywhere. It was like, it was like God came down and just said, "Not today." I mean, it was every inside your ears, inside your eyelids, fucking everywhere. I mean, it was the strangest thing. Um, we got back on. We started doing like the TBI reporting. Um, you know, what's your name? And I was feeling fucking weird. The three guys who were on that porch were feeling very weird, um, and you couldn't explain it. Um, cause I've been, I've been knocked out a bunch with fight club and skateboarding. Like I am no stranger to concussion. This is very different. Um, I went into a med check and they shined the eyes, uh, the white light of my eyes and I threw up and then I started getting scared. I still can't hear shit. Both my ears are perfed. Um, I've got a bunch of other wounds pre-existing that are nasty. I've got a nasty stomach infection, um, like an open wound that I had. We had to surgically super glue before we did it. So I had all kinds of shit I was battling anyway, and it kept getting worse. And we finally got back to base it's five days later. And I remember laying in my bed with my sunglasses on, wanting to die. Um, I didn't know what the fuck was going on with me. I couldn't make rhyme or reason. I, um, I couldn't get my thoughts together. I couldn't get anything. 
I couldn't be there for the debrief. I was just, I was fucking out of it. Um, and I didn't know what was going on. And they drove me to a French hospital out in town and they ran a, a CT scan in the back of my skull, right back here was jet black in my brain. And, uh, the, uh, the doctor came back and she's like, what, what is that? I was like, I don't know. You tell me. And she's like, I don't know how you're standing right now. She's like, that's a major, that's a major blow to the back of your head. Nothing hit me in the back of the head. She's like, well, something did. I don't remember any of that. Um, I remember seeing the MRI and I remember just telling him like, that's just overpressure, man. Like that's just overpressure. And, um, they said whatever they did, um, they got documented, you know, we finish all that and we fly home. Um, I'm on the next flight home to near the deployment. That's the last thing to happen. We fly home and I land and I have a six month old waiting for me. I land, I drive straight home and there is a newborn laying in that crib. Be dad. And dude, the next 48 hours of my fucking life. Um, I didn't even know what to say. I just, I couldn't, everything started to go to shit. I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember my wife's name. I couldn't remember my daughter's name. Um, I got lost driving to fucking work. You've been to Virginia Beach. I called my wife one time in the fucking Norfolk Scope parking lot. Crying my eyes out. I don't know where the fuck I'm at. Amnesia set in. Um, I'd wake up in places. Um, I'd go to drive to work on a Sunday and I'd end up at, uh, <laughs> uh, like the farmer's market. I called Patsy. I was like, I don't know where the fuck I'm at. I yeah. couldn't remember anything. Um, and I had no rhyme or reason. I couldn't say it to anybody, but everybody else was having the exact same fucking thing going on. Um, and it was only getting worse. Every day it would get worse. And the headaches were so bad. The photophobia was so bad. I wore sunglasses for years. I didn't until we got it under control. Um, I remember, I'm, I remember coming to one day I was in the gym, um, out in town, wife doing CrossFit or some shit. And I woke up, I'm flat on my back and I'm looking up at her and she's kneeling over me and she is bawling her eyes out. Like tears are falling on my face. And I look at her and I was like, what, what's going on? She's like, what the fuck have you been? She's like, you've been laying there for 15 minutes. I don't remember going to the gym. I don't remember doing anything. I don't remember anything about that morning. I don't remember that night. I remember shit. Um, like my long-term memory, um, people, places, things, like it's, it escapes me. It does. And um, it was getting real bad. And we had a, we had a heavy breaching trip coming up. And um, my boss at the time knew I was in a fucking jam. Like he knew I was. Um, he didn't know how bad, but he's like, I don't think you should go on this breaching trip, man. He's like, you just, you're good. You're current. There's no reason to go down there and ring your bell any more than you need to. Just take some time off. Okay. And I didn't want to. And I end up going down to medical to uh, fill out some kind of paperwork or something. And I'm having a conversation with uh, one of the docs there. And um, I don't know how I said it. I don't know what I said. But it was something to the effect of, I don't know if I'm going to kill myself or kill my wife. But there was something going on with me and you have to fucking stop me. And the next thing I remember is the command doc, the command psych, who's a fucking angel, and my boss, are sitting in a chair with their hands on my shoulder, giving me volume and telling me it'll be okay. Hmm. And then I go to NICO. <laughs> no. So my trip to NICO was not, um, not something I wanted. Um, I was in a bad jam. And when I, when I showed up there, like, I, didn't know, I didn't know what was going on with me. I had no idea. Well, before we get into NICO, I talked to your uh, wife for maybe 45 minutes the other day, and uh, she had some kind of intuition uh, while, the, while that op was going on that you were in trouble. She said she just felt something, and uh, I'm sure as shit, she was right. So you got home. She said uh, one of the first things she noticed was your dinner was right in front of you. And you didn't even realize it. And you're asking when, when the fuck are we going to have dinner? She's like, dinner's right in front of you. She, uh, she took one. I'd pull up, uh, I'd pull up videos on her phone because I know she was sending them to people. Um, I mean, there was a video specifically, I was cutting steak and it was like six minutes just over and over the same piece, just cutting it. I'd go into these trances. 
Um, and I remember it now, like going into a trance and telling myself to come out of it. And I couldn't. It just, I'd forget to come out of it. I would. I just, I'd lose track of time. Um, I just, I didn't know. I thought I was going fucking crazy. And then it was the whole CTE thing was coming on board. And it's like, yep, this is exactly what this shit is. Like everything got super dark. Um, oh, fuck, man. I'd sit in my, uh, I just wanted to die. I did. I've, I wanted to fucking die. And I didn't know why. Um, I had the picture perfect life. I had a badass wife, gorgeous kid, dream job. <laughs> fucking, my life was heaven. And all I wanted to do was die. Yeah. I didn't know why. I'd sit in my guest room with that fucking dog of mine and uh, I'd talk to him. I would. Like that, that dog saved me more times than any fucking thing else, dude. I'd sit there and uh, the obsession over the details are probably what saved me the most because I'd think about putting Patsy through that. I'd think about the reality of shooting myself and the scene it would make in this house, the mess it would make, that she's going to have to clean that up. What am I... <laughs> What's my kid going to find out? Or what are they going to say when they find out? And I ended up just not doing it. Um, but I wanted to. And then I started to turn into other things. Like, I got to get my rocks off somehow. Like, what's my outlet going to be? Like, threading the needle. Like, that was the only thing that made me feel alive. Is the sketchier shit would go, the more I liked it. Um, man, it just... That TBI shit gets away from you fast. It, um, and nobody talks about it. Yeah. Sit in those fucking rooms and I know those dudes feel the exact same way I do and they're not saying anything. Um, and they never did. I think that started to drive a wedge because I needed it so bad. I needed someone to confirm that I wasn't going fucking crazy. And because the, because of the teams, you know, not wanting to show weakness. No one did. And I thought I was alone. Other people, you know, they check in, they do this, they do that, but it didn't matter. Like, I'm not, I'm not telling anybody I'm fucked up. I'm just wondering why no one else has anything wrong with them. Yeah. Like, none of this shit ever affects you? Nothing? Like, you're not human? No? Never get headaches? Nope. You ever feel weird after a full day of breaching? Nope. You ever piss blood? Nope. Hmm. You ever forget where the fuck you're at? Nope. Maybe I am crazy. Maybe I am the only fucking one. That drove me way down the fucking rabbit hole. Because now I've spent my entire life to hit a fucking pinnacle and I can't remember anything. It's all escaping me. Um, yeah, I mean, Patsy, uh, she called the command. She called my boss and she's like, you have no idea what the fuck is going on with him. She's like, he's going to kill himself. She's like, he needs you guys right fucking now. We have to figure this out. And Nike was very new um, on the scene right then. So that was uh, yeah, 2014. Went inpatient Nike for 30 days. And they did a whole workup on me and put me on all kinds of fancy uh, prescriptions. And uh, they helped. They did. Um, I thought I was having seizures. Um, I didn't know what a panic attack was. Um, I didn't know what uh, real anxiety was. I remember sitting in the chow hall and um, I remember sweating into, uh, <laughs> into my food and people looking at me, like sweating through my beard um, because of so much sensory overload in that fucking cafeteria. Chopping, chewing, hitting the fork, banging, the dude in the back washing pots and pans, it all just consumed me. And I just sat there and I'd, I'd just start fucking sweating. Like, fuck man, I gotta get the fuck out of here, I gotta get the fuck out of here. And I'd have to leave. And uh, I tried to make it not a big deal, but it was a big deal because I was solo. Actually, I wasn't solo. Just no one fucking tell me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, uh, we went up to Nike. We did the full workup. Got put on um, a bunch of different meds. Probably 15, 15 prescriptions. Um, got put on a stimulant, so Adderall, to kind of keep me focused, which helped. Cymbalta. Um, we did Zoloft, uh, we did everything. Prazacin at night to stop the dreams. We did beta blockers, we did everything. Um, and basically ran that concoction along with tramadol and everything else 
basically the duration. Um, it wasn't until the very end when I got hurt one more time when I realized what that shit actually was. But. Let's take a break there. All right, so we're back from NICO. Did they, you got the prescriptions. Did they give you any insight as to what was going on with you medically? Yeah, they, um, they went through the you know, full body, head to toe, every MRI, contrast, I mean, everything you could do to the human body, they ran tests for. Um, had a couple spots on a brain, but nothing crazy. But they also back it up with, we've had people come in here in wheelchairs, pushing themselves around on straws with no spots in our brain. So they couldn't really make rhyme or reason, um, just concussion, um, operator syndrome, a bunch of that kind of stuff. The TBI um, ocular stuff, so I, um, the overpressure messed up my right eye, so I can't really focus it. So they called it TBI-related ocular dysfunction. So I've got to wear glasses. Um, like if I really try to dial in a shot, it all goes to a haze. I can't do a super finite focus. So it makes shooting kind of weird. My depth perception is kind of off, but I'm used to it now. And then I had five surgeries I had to get. They wanted to do both shoulders, both hips, and my lower back. Um, the neck was a, uh, they wanted to do a, um, fuck, I can't even remember. Um, some kind of surgery on my neck. Um, and I did not want to do it. <laughs> All the docs were like, hey, if you can get by, then push it off. Like, I didn't want to get surgery. I didn't want to miss a deployment. We were gearing back up. I mean, I was in that thing for 30 days. Like, I was going fucking crazy. All this shit is happening to you, and you're worried about missing a fucking deployment? That's the only fucking thing I cared about. That's why I was so pissed. I was like, why can't I just go to Portsmouth right up the road and come to work every day? And I didn't realize what NICO was. It's to get away from the phone, decompress completely. Um, and it was fucking rough, man. That um, I, was not, I was not good with that shit. To be able to pull the phone away, because you're glued to it. Um, you're waiting for that thing to ring to say to come to work all fucking day. And it becomes, um, I mean, my nightly routine, dude, I'd, uh, I'd check that phone. Team guys exaggerate. This is no exaggeration. I bet you I checked that phone 50 times a day Damn. to make sure my battery was charged. Was my, <laughs> was the charging cable plugged in right? Like all that different shit. Like I have a, I have a serious phobia with being late, like an unhealthy one. Um, and the thought of missing a movement was not a fucking option. Um, I wouldn't go on family vacations that involve flying or long distance travel. If we had a trip coming up, like, no, I can't miss work. I can't do it. So we get there and uh, we're in NICO and we're doing the whole thing. And that facility was amazing. Um, from the acupuncture to, I mean, everything they did there was amazing. Um, and they fucking saved me. I was in a bad spot um, and they see all kinds of people um, that staff really bent over backward to me. And I think it's because they, um, they saw where I worked. They saw how young I was and they saw how devastated I was that, um, I was potentially done. And they came in at the end of it, 30 days. They diagnosed me with all kinds of crazy shit. Um, I mean, everything. And they recommended that I get medically retired. He's like, Hey, it's not going to get better, dude. He's like, you need major surgery all over. And they almost got me. They, uh, they almost got me. They pulled a guilt trip and they were like, do you think you can perform your best like this? And I knew the answer was no, um, but my ego caught me. And I went, 
fucking outperform you. Give me these meds and let me go see. And dude, I, I ran hard. I ran full tilt for the next four years from 14 to 18, as hard as I could go. Never missed a day of work. Um, it was the best time of my life. What did your wife think? Did she <laughs> want you to retire? Yeah, because what nobody else saw is what I was like at home. Um, I was fucking vile, man. I spit venom out of my mouth all day long. I was just fucking hateful. I hated everything. Anything that wasn't to do with work, I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, you know, my daughter was a burden. Being married was a burden. Having a dog was a burden. You know, having to do taxes was a fucking burden. Like, why can't you just let me be like one of the 300 fucking Spartans and let me just do this. This is my profession. Can everybody just cater to me and walk around and fucking fan me? That's what I wanted. I did. Like, my ego consumed me. And anything that potentially could derail me or um, slow me down in any way was not an option. It just wasn't. I couldn't let it happen. Um, and the only way to obsess over work, um, and I felt and do it at the full commitment that I needed to, was to have no attachments. So I emotionally started to separate from my wife, from my kids. Um, you know, I tried to play the game when I came home, but it wasn't. I was thinking about work the entire time. I didn't want to change diapers. Um, it was just, it was, I wanted a kid so fucking bad with her. And in 2013, I got one and I was fucking, I was through the fucking roof, man. I've never been so happy my whole life. And I went overseas. She was, you know, two months old and I got hurt. And when I came back, I just, it ate me alive. And when I went to NICO, it got even worse. Now I'm, I'm separated. Now they're telling me there's something wrong with me and it's not going to get better. Now I look at my family and I start to resent them like, you fucking did this to me. If I wasn't thinking about being a fucking father, if I wasn't thinking about being a husband, it probably wouldn't have fucking happened to me. I started to blame shift on everybody. That's what I did. Um, I threw my walls back up. I'm like, yep, yeah, we're going to lean forward in this. I'm going to give this thing everything I can and I'm going to ride this fucker all the way through. I never in a million years thought I'd get medically retired. Never. I'd never fucking let him. No. There's no fucking way. I'm too hurt. But I'm medicated. I'm fine. Like, I'm good. Um, I was shooting Imitrex probably five, six times a week. Um, auto injectors for migraines. Um, I was taking essentially a lethal dose of Maxalt um, for migraines. You're supposed to take three a week. I'd take three a day. Um, I was in a fucking jam, man. When the sun would come up in crest, my world ended. When that sunlight hit my eyes, it was over. Were you deploying with all this? Yep. I wore sunglasses all the time. Medicated. Um, it got real bad one night. Um, it was probably 10 o'clock at night. Um, I walked into the uh, walked into the kitchen, and I don't know why. I don't know what the fuck I was doing, but I hit the uh, I hit the microwave, and the light came on and hit my eyes just right, and I fucking collapsed. I pissed myself. Started dry heaving. I'm in the fetal position, just shaking. Um, I was shaking so hard and I didn't know why. I couldn't control it. It felt like I was gonna break my own hands. I, it was all I could do. It was like I was trying to pop my own head off by squeezing everything as tight as I could. Um, and I hadn't had a migraine like that in a while um, because I stayed doped up all the time. I was constantly taking Maxol and Imitrex and everything else. And I thought I had him at bay and this fucking thing hit me, dude. And it, uh, she was trying to call 911 and I'm screaming at her. I'm calling her every name in the book. Um, don't you fucking dare. She's, <laughs> that was her big threat. She's like, I'm going to call your troop chief. Don't you fucking dare. Don't you fucking dare. Um, <laughs> and she should have. I was in fucking, I was in a bad spot, man. Um, and everything on me hurt. It's so like you said, if I'm, um, if I'd miss a dose of Tramadol, I felt everything I had. I'd go to the gym in the morning and I'd fake it and I was fucking miserable. Like I had never felt that much pain. I got diagnosed with a uh, fibromyalgia when I was, uh, when I was up there and for the ones that don't know, it's uh, it's basically a made up term. It's when you have uh, agonizing pain and they can't tell you why they label it fibromyalgia. Hmm. But for me, um, it felt like I had shin splints on every ounce of my body. Um, like when you shook my hand, it felt like you were breaking my hands. 
my feet when I would walk. I could feel it. It felt like my feet were splintering. Um, it was terrible. Every step I took, I was just in agonizing fucking pain. So I just ate painkillers all day. Um, and I masked it. And I trained. And I deployed. And I did not every trip I could. Anything to get me away from Virginia Beach to just escape reality. And it didn't pay off. Um, I, was, I was hurt a lot worse than I really thought I was. Um, I mean, I felt bad. I didn't realize um, it was only a matter of time before I all came apart. Um, I'd go through these long bouts of depression, weeks on end. Um, I wouldn't want to speak. I'd sit there, I wouldn't want to eat. Um, I'd lose motivation. I wouldn't want to go work out, and then I'd start to make excuses. Um, you know, when you lose focus on the why, you know, you don't have the target set you want, you don't have funding, you don't have the leadership you want, you don't have this, you don't have that, and you lose focus on why you're actually there. Because none of that shit fucking matters. The enemy hopes you're not training. He hopes you don't have funding. He hopes you haven't seen the inside of the gym in two fucking weeks. He hopes you don't know where your guns are right now. That's what he's hoping. And I let it consume me. Um, and I just started to hate everything. And then I found skydiving. Um, Did you start doing that recreational? Yeah. Um, I really started to obsess over it. Like that was, that was kind of my thing when I was uh, at the command anyway. Um, I wanted to be a breacher. That's all I wanted to be. I fucking love breaching. And the team I rolled into had a bunch of badass breachers already. They don't need another one. They need a guy to run all the air stuff. So I went way down the jump rabbit hole. And um, the only bad thing about that is it's so far removed um, from what the teams are because it's such a civilian dominated sport that I started to hang out with everybody who wasn't a team guy. I'd go out on these long trips to Arizona to support courses and, you know, I'd four or 500 jumps a year and um, want to start competing. And, and that was so unlike me to do anything outside of work. The fact that I would go recreationally skydive, like that's, that's what my wife said. She said, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm doing it for work. I'm doing it because they asked me, I don't need you to be a breach, uh, breacher. I need for you to be an air subject matter expert. I need for you to be the best jumper in the room. <laughs> Done. If you had asked me to be a fucking dental tech, I'd be a tier one fucking dental tech. It didn't matter. If that's what you wanted me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And I obsessed over it. I spent a lot of personal money and a shit ton of time out there jumping and wind tunnel and got all my instructor certifications and, you know, throwing out tandems and everything else. And, but it started to remove me from the group. Um, I started running a bunch of solo projects or me or one or two guys. And we'd go out there and we'd just jump. We'd go do 100 jumps in a week. I mean, we jumped. Um, and it really started to take a toll on the family life. Like, I was gone a lot. I can remember um, her sick as a fucking dog, like puking over the toilet, begging me not to go on this trip. And I looked at her, no sympathy. I'm like, gotta go. I didn't have to go. That was a made-up trip. That was a fun trip for me. You know, we'd have a work trip to start on Monday. I'd fly out the Friday before. And I'd get a whole weekend with a jump with all my friends and the work trip would start. And then I'd stay late. So I turned a two-week trip into a three-week trip. So was it the fun you were after or was it just getting the fuck out of... Uh, it was getting the fuck out of Virginia Beach. It was yeah. something completely different that I didn't have to answer to anybody for. It was my own. Um, completely separate group of friends who didn't know me. Didn't, they didn't give a shit about my background. I mean, they knew. They didn't ask. Um... They didn't care about the politics. They didn't care about what happened overseas. They just, they liked me for me and they liked skydiving. And I used that as an outlet, but I really used it to just separate myself from my family. And um, just, I threw up another wall. Like I had my Virginia beach life and I have my jump life and I'm just running straight this way. And um, she hated, I mean, she begged me. She begged me, stop going. Stop jumping, stop doing this, stop doing that. And I wouldn't, I couldn't, I was so addicted to it. And it wasn't even the jumping itself. It was just escaping reality. When I'm flying around, when I'm jumping these super small parachutes and doing whatever, I'm escaping reality. My reality is I am fucking miserable and I'm waiting to die. And I'm just unhappy. I don't have any justification for it. I can't make rhyme or reason, but if I say anything, 
they're definitely going to kick me out of here. So I'm going to suffer in silence and I'm going to run this fucking thing until the wheels fall off. That's what I did. I ran it all the way. What was the wake up call? Was it the accident? I, um, I went down to Florida, me and my shooting buddy, and a couple of the guys, um, we were doing a civilian, um, skydive trip. It's like a big camp. Um, it's a certain type of free flying we were doing and, um, it was amazing and great time, but I was so broken from everything else. Um, things you just don't realize. Um, so we're on the, we're on the first day of the jump trip and we're flying in a, uh, a formation. It's called upright. Basically you're standing and you're flying across uh, the sky on two feet and flying that way. And you have to lean back with your arm as far as you can. You have to press down into the relative wind to get the throw to launch you forward. Um, so it's understanding all the details and everything else. You know, it's trick flying, but it's fun. You build a lot of speed. And I was so broken up top. Um, I got the video I'll show it to you. I leaned back as far as I could and we're hauling ass and all of a sudden I flip over and I feel a weird pop and my chin locks to my shoulder. I'm in free fall and I can't move my arm. It's pinned behind my back. I'm like, what the fuck? I roll over and I start to track away to try to get away from the group. We're probably at 7,000 feet and we're taking it low. We exit at 14,000 feet. So we're, you know, a little over halfway through the skydive, but that's the dangerous part. It's when we have to break away so we don't open on top of each other. And I turn, I track away, and I go to pull, and I can't pull. My hand's in a knot. It's locked up. I can't deploy. And I jump a small parachute anyway, and I'm not a packet of peanuts. Um, so I had to open up my reserve. And I open that thing up, and it's super small. And that's something you don't think about, having to land uh, a small parachute with one hand. So I lift my arm up, and I unstow the toggle, and I... I loop it in here and I'm flying super, um, super casual pattern on the way in. I come in with one hand, I land, I get up and I've got a jumpsuit on and my arm is paralyzed. Like it's, it's hanging down to my hip. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but the only thing that kept coming up in my mind is they were concerned on, um, uh, taking Cymbalta, taking the Tramadol and three or four of the medications that I've been taking forever. And they're like, you have to stop taking that or you're going to stroke out, man. Like you'll have a fucking stroke. I thought that's what it was. I thought I had a stroke mid free fall. I mean, like when I came down, I was pinned like this. I couldn't do shit. I couldn't lift my arm. I couldn't do anything. They couldn't get my jumpsuit off when they did. My humeral head was down to here. So what happened is I reached my arms back to fly and my arm dislocated through my armpit. So humeral head attached and it came through my armpit. That's a very bad dislocation. It's very hard to reset, uh, especially when um, a little bigger than it's probably like, you know, bigger. And uh, I landed on the ground and I remember standing on my hand, trying to lift up to try to pop it. It still hadn't hit my mind that my shoulders out of socket. I've never had one dislocate like that. I've had them in and out, but not like that. Um, my teammates here, he's like, dude, what the fuck? I'm like, I don't know what to do. You've got an ER you know, a mile and a half down the road. I was like, I'm going. I jump in a rental car and I drive myself right to the ER. I'm still in my jumpsuit. Um, they go up on the next lift. They continue jumping. I check myself into the ER. I tell them what happened. Um, and they spend two hours trying to get this thing back in socket. Let me preface this. I pride myself on my pain tolerance. It's world class. I can take an extraordinary amount of pain. I can. That shit. Oh my God. <laughs> That dude cranked on my shoulder. I was sweating. I was dry heaving. Um, I wanted to fucking die. He was bad. And uh, finally, they gave me um, propofol, whatever it is. Knocked me out. Mm-hmm. Reset it. And uh, they put me in a sling. He's like, hey, you got to go back. Um, I'm freaking out because I don't want to tell work what has happened. So now, my little hamster wheel's going around. I'm like, I don't have to tell anybody about this. I'm like, we're good. I drive back out to the drop zone. I see all the instructors, all... All the guys like, what happened? I was like, fucking arm came out. They're like, Jesus. And all the guys like, hey man, we'll refund you for your for the camp because you can't jump. The fuck are you talking about? I'm jumping. He's like, you can't jump. Your shoulder just came out of sock. And I was like, I'm jumping. I'll take the rest of the day off. I'll be back tomorrow. 
we went out to uh went out to like a food line or whatever and bought a bunch of kt tape and youtubed it and kt taped my shoulder in place um put on a, a quasi brace that we bought from you know whatever pinned my shoulder in, just taped it so all i could do was deploy and i could reach up um and i could grab my toggles and i could steer it which made landing very uh very challenging because i jump a high performance parachute so i really have to be able to control this thing and i just let my ego get a hold of me and i didn't give a fuck they uh i showed up the next morning they did not want me to jump we had a conversation and uh we settled on a wager if you can do 10 pull-ups right now i'll let you jump and I jumped on that bar and did 10 pull-ups so fucking fast. And he went, go ahead. And I put my suit back on. I went up and did a jump very gingerly, um, not getting real dynamic. Did a second one, did a third one, did a fourth one. And on the fourth one, I got a little cocky. And I had leaned into it a little bit too much on final, bringing a parachute, and it popped out of socket again. The exact same thing. Through the armpit, the exact same fucking way. And the instructor looked at me. Because it's not common to fall on landing, um, not at that level. And they looked at me and gave me a weird look, and I was like, "I was like, get any more fucking banana peels out here?" Trying to, you know, brush it off. And then I looked at him. I was like, "Hey, man, like, I kind of tweaked my neck on that opening. I'm just gonna sit out the rest of the day." And I walked around that DZ for an hour, faking it, because I was so fucking embarrassed. And I was like, "Yeah, you don't, guys. I think we go back to the hotel. I'll be back in an hour to pick you guys up." And I drove straight over the ER. Now in civilian clothes, had changed. And I walked in, the exact same doctor is working the exact same desk and looks at me and went, what can I do you for? I was like, I was putting on this t-shirt and my, uh, my shoulder came out. We got to put it back in. And he looked at me and smiled and he reached out and grabbed a blade of grass out of my ear and went, getting dressed out in the field, are we? Come on. Went back, knocked me out, popped it back in place. Um, and I didn't jump the rest of that trip. I couldn't, it was so bad. Um, and I knew how bad it was. Like the amount of pain that was going through my body was uncommon and it couldn't be good. We get back to the command. Um, I walk into rehab and I tell him, I was like, hey man, I got some serious shit going on. He's like, ah, oh, we'll go in there. We've got you know great shoulder surgeons, um, super experienced. And we went in there and looked at that thing and he went, dude, this is gonna be the one. Like, this is it. I'm like, yeah, whatever. We'll do a quick one. It wasn't a quick one. We um, we went and did that shoulder surgery. We uh, we did the Mumford. We cut out a section of my collarbone. We did the bicep tendinesis. So relocated my bicep tendon. We put in two anchors in the front, five in the back. I got a nasty infection. We found out that I'm allergic to the waterproof bandages they put on me. So I got uh, infleculitis. Almost like cellulitis, just gnarly infections all over me, dude, like bad. Um, and the rehab process after shoulder surgery is not fun. It's long. You can't rush it. It takes six months. And by the time I got done with that, um, the medical paperwork had already been pushed. He's like, you got to do the exact same thing to the left, and we've still got to do both your hips. Like, we got to fuse your neck. We got to fuse your lower back. Like, that's it, man. And I was in so much pain at that point when we got done with that shoulder surgery. Um, not throwing anybody under the bus, but I, I will. They forgot to do my nerve block when I got oh, that shoulder shit. surgery. So I went in, we do the whole thing, and uh, I wake up in the recovery room, and this, that operation was supposed to be two hours, and I was in there almost six. Long fucking surgery. A bunch of stuff in there, a bunch of... Um, bone fragments are floating around. Um, your shoulder dislocates and slams back in. It chips away the corners. I've got a couple four millimeter pieces of bone floating around in there. They can't get to. Um, four millimeters? Uh huh. Yeah. So my humeral head, it just broke off big chunks of it. Now it's just free floating in there, just grinding everything out. So I wake up in this shoulder surgery. You got your arm pinned, you're in the sling. And I wake up and I'm overcome by it. Like, if you would have had a pistol sitting on the thing, I would have shot myself. It, it's indescribable how bad that pain was. It was, it was everything. <laughs> it was reality. And that doctor walked over and he's like, how are you feeling? I've never felt this much pain in my entire life. 
And he's like, nerve block not help? Did you do one? His eyes get real big and he looks at me. He's like, I'll be right back. He leaves, comes back three minutes later with two other doctors. And uh, he's like, hey. So we decided not to give you the nerve block. Now we're going to give it to you post-surgery so it'll be more effective for you. Okay. And they free, <laughs> they freehand this thing. Usually you do it under, uh, um, under like an x-ray or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and they don't. They just drop this thing in. They hit me. It's from the spine, can, right? What's that? It's from the spine, right? Uh, they did it through my neck. Through your neck? Yeah. So you hit some nerve bundle just above your collarbone. It basically just paralyzes everything from here to here. Oh, okay. So he misses it. And a couple minutes later, I remember sitting there and I'm doing touch and goes. You're all fucked up from the anesthesia. And I remember leaning my head back and my tongue was paralyzed and it rolled in the back of my throat. And I, I essentially started to swallow my own tongue. And I remember throwing my head over the side and scooping my tongue out. And I couldn't breathe. I was gasping. And it was nothing. <laughs> Trying to scream. I can't get anything out. There's no nurse there. It's after hours. I had a later surgery. Um, this is probably 8 o'clock at night. I mean, it's, everybody's gone at this point. Men manning at the hospital. And I remember I grabbed the, uh, the little monitor, the EKG thing, and I knocked it on the ground. I remember this lady came running out of the back, and I'm holding my throat like this. And her eyes got as big as silver dollars. And I remember them shoving an O2 mask on me. And then I remember waking up later. <laughs> um, so what had happened was they hit the wrong nerve bundle and it paralyzed my throat, my voice box, my tongue, and my right lung. Um, and I was just drifting off the... Holy shit. I just would have passed out. Would have been over. Um, so the whole rehab process comes after that. Um, but after that, because the pain was so bad... We go to pain management and now I get on more meds and now I'm on all kinds of weird shit. Now it's like, they're just stacking it on top of me over and over and over and it's not getting better. It's only getting worse. Um, to the point where I don't know what I'm going to do anymore. Um, but I'm having some very hard conversations with Patsy and everybody else. Like if this is what I have to live with daily, Oh no. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Like, I can't lift my arm. Like, just the whole rehab process was so fucking bad. And luckily, you know, we start the medical retirement thing, but it takes so long to actually get there. What kind of conversations are you having? Are you talking suicidal? Yeah. Yeah? Um, You're having conversations about suicide with your wife. Uh Uh-huh. How many times did that happen? More than you can count? Yeah. And it was one of those things, like I told her, I was like, I don't, I don't know what the fuck is going on with me. Like I sit here and I just, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Um, kind of just everything from my childhood and everything through the teams and just everything just felt like he was hanging around my fucking neck, man. And I couldn't do it anymore. I was just, I was fucking tired. I feel like that's the common theme with dudes when they hit that spot is that's what they say. I'm just so fucking tired. I just don't want to do it anymore. Just like reality set in like that was it. I'm not coming back from that one. Um, and we got through rehab. The med board had already started. Um, we had hip surgery scheduled. We had my left shoulder um, scheduled. And it was going to be three years of, uh, of surgery windows. I'm like, I can't fucking do this, man. That rehab was so bad. Um, it took everything out of me. It was fucking miserable. The Navy SEAL Foundation stepped in and they had a, a rehab program ran by an ex-team guy, actually from the command, Virginia High Performance. Um, they chop you with a uh, world strath, world-class strength conditioning coach. They cater your meals, you do two workouts a day, you do the float tank, massage, um, hyperbaric, you do everything. And it's basically a, a four-week block. You can extend and do eight weeks. So I did eight weeks with those guys. And I came out of that no shit in the best shape of my entire life. Really? I felt like I don't need to be retired. Like, I'm good. I was high as a kite. I was on every med I was already on. Um, but I looked apart. I looked fucking great. Um, and I still wanted to die inside. But I still, my ego, it wouldn't let it go. Like, I can still do this. I can still do this. Um, and then I couldn't. I just couldn't do it anymore. 
I ended up going to um, a neurobehavioral ward um, at, um, at Bethesda. So right across the street from NICO. It's called Seven East. Um, and it is for a, it's essentially a detox clinic. So in between all of that, I go back in to refill my prescriptions in our physician's assistant. He was brand new and he inputted all my stuff in and hit enter and an error code popped up. And he went, I can't give you that. He's like, you can't take that and this. It's like, no. Well, that's a problem because I've been taking that for a long time and I fucking need it. And he had a very candid conversation with me and he's like, no. What do we do now? Whole team came together and they're like, we've got a med washout we want to do. You know, you're starting the med board right now. Let's get you off all these meds and we'll figure out what your baseline really is. And we'll go from there. Okay. And somehow they suckered me into it. Um, and I was not expecting that. I expected to go back to NICO. And it was not NICO. Hmm. We walked in and they took shoestrings, dental floss, tooth. Uh, they went through everything. You couldn't have anything. And uh, there were a couple of SF guys in there, a couple of Rangers, a bunch of guys, like some, some pretty bad TBI shit. Um, one of the guys, uh, he was a fighter pilot, had, a, had an ejection ride. And it gave him Parkinson's. So to be able to watch people, how bad it can get, it really made me feel uh, feel like a giant pussy. Like you see how bad some of these dudes are. And I got there, um, and I never forget, man. She walked in, and uh, <laughs> this sweet little black lady. She looked at me and she goes, Are "You ready?" And I went, "Yeah." Oh, child. Okay. She reached in, grabbed all my meds, and she's like, not anymore. And she locked me in that room. I bet you I was in there seven days. I didn't really leave that room for seven days. I laid in a fetal position, and I detoxed off everything I had been on. And it was the worst thing that's ever fucking happened to me. Um, I heard pissing in the bed, throwing up. Um, I mean, everything. <sighs> You're talking about the spirit world, man, like... Being alone in isolation, no cell phone, no nothing, it, uh, it consumed me. I didn't have skydiving. I didn't have the team. I didn't have my wife. I didn't have anything. I was just, I was ate up, dude. I was ate the fuck up. It, uh, it was bad. And around the seven, 10 day mark, I kind of came out of the haze and I walked out for one of the first times and sit down with a group and had breakfast and I was sober for the first time and I was in agonizing pain. Like, oh my God, this is, this is normal. This is reality right here. This is where I'm at. And we slowly started to input a couple meds. Um, they left me on a couple things, just no, no painkillers. I couldn't do it anymore. Um, from the NSAID use over the years, I've got like stomach ulcers. So if I take an 800 milligram Motrin, I piss blood, like weird stuff. So. Had to come off all the insides, and the only thing they left me with was Cymbalta and Adderall, which hindsight being 2020, I probably should have came off those. But at the time, I couldn't. I couldn't even fathom it. Uh, my anxiety was so bad, my depression was so bad, and those pills were the only thing that kept me sane. And I say sane relatively. Yeah. I was in a bad spot. Um, but Patsy came up to see me in the hospital, drove up there, and um, you think it would have gotten better, and it didn't. Um, so now we've got two kids, got a brand newborn, and uh, I'm just in a bag of shit. So I come back from that and essentially got Mila, my youngest, who's now my therapy baby. I'm just laying in, the, laying in the bed, just feeling sorry for myself. Um, I don't really know where I'm going from here, but I know my career is over. I know I'm miserable. I know I really want to take a bunch of pills to stop feeling like this, but I can't. And I don't know what I'm going to do. Hmm. They introduce art therapy. It's kind of where the whole tribe skate thing started to go. It was a spillover from NICO. I started art therapy at NICO, and then um, the whole staff knew me, and they all remembered me. So when they heard I was next door, they opened up the facility, and I could go over there as much as I wanted to. They let me uh, do the dog program, so I got to hang out with puppies all day, therapy dogs, and do all that. Um, and the Red Cross walked in one day. She's like, what can I bring you? 
How about a blank skateboard deck and some paintbrushes? She went, I'll make that happen. And she wasn't supposed to. You're not supposed to leave that place. And she snuck me out. She walked me downstairs and put me in her car and drove me out in downtown Bethesda to a skateboard shop and bought me a blank skateboard. Oh, with her own shit. fucking money. Snuck me out. Totally could have got in trouble. <laughs> and brought me back. And she's like, if anybody asked, it just showed up here. Like, yes, ma'am. And I made my first board. Big paper mache thing with a bunch of fucking hands coming out of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Just, you know the whole mass concept you do? Yeah. Neither. It was essentially that, but I did it on a skateboard. And I just dumped everything I had in me on that board. And I felt better. I had an SF guy who was going through a, a dark spot, a real bad spot. Same thing, his career, he was not ready to go. Had him do the same thing. Like, just try it. Just paint this whole thing white. Paint the whole fucking thing black. Now do this, now do that. Started to help, conversation started to go, and we got to relive experiences and, you know, that art therapy shit, it helped. Uh, we were in that thing for 31 consecutive days, inpatient, um, detoxing off meds, having to talk to all kinds of therapists about your feelings and pain management specialist. Um, and the big thing I got out of it, I was able to override pain so well um, that I couldn't tell if I was hurt or if I was injured. I couldn't tell the difference anymore. Everything felt the same. Um, if I stub my big toe or if you break my leg, it, it all felt the same. I didn't care. Uh, I mean, we'd go in there for some of these things and I'd have these long conversations with the doc and they'd ask and they wanted to know tips and tricks on how I get over this. And um, I talk about things I do mentally to try to flush out some of the pain I was feeling. Um, you know, I was doing breathing drills way before it was a cool thing to do. And um, I'd imagine, like, I'd, I'd go deep thought concentration. I would, I'd pain away pain. I'd just spread loaded throughout my entire body so it wasn't isolated in one spot. And I became successful at it. But it doesn't last forever. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it was so bad when I came out of that fucking place. So that's how Tribe's case was born. Art therapy. Yeah, man. Like, I came out of there and, you know, you're getting ready to retire. The reality of the thing's going to happen and you don't know what you're going to do. I got a contract. Like, what is it? Did you know you were retiring at this point? I knew, yeah. The med board had already started. Um, we're into, we've crested into 2019 now. Um, I'm still jumping a little bit um, from what I can. Um, I'm contracting, working some courses in my off time, just maintaining currency, all that. And then that's when we get to, uh, to tribe skates and like, I actually made it a thing. We brought in coal and we had a shop and it was my, uh, it was my little therapeutic outlet. Didn't make any money, but it kept me sane. Was Cole still in at this point? Yeah, he was still in. Okay. Yep. Yeah, he transitioned over. He was doing, um, like a training position, um, but his med board was about to start. He was banged up. He's had you know, multiple surgeries. He's chewed up. Um, and that's when I got into fracture burning. <laughs> it's like I had to replace something, some sort of danger element with something else. So the skydiving I couldn't do right now, I'm going to the med board. If I got hurt again, they are definitely going to fry me. Um, I just have to sit back here and I just have to, when you go through that, they take all your specialty pays away. Um, so you used to make an X amount, chop that in half, and that's what they maintain you at. And that process can last as long as they need it to. And I had a lot of injuries. My medical record's two volumes. Um, they take your fucking pays away? The day. The day you start it. Every specialty pay goes away. Um, sometimes, they, you know, I've heard rumors, guys having to pay back reenlistment bonuses. Um, all kinds of shit, man. Like, yeah. it's bad, but they hold you to that. So now the lifestyle you've been accustomed to living, you can't afford to live that anymore. So now what do you do? Just get depressed. You can't get a job. <clears throat> they won't let you have outside employment. So what do you do? Just miserable. You're just waiting to finally retire. If they would have given the option just to leave, I just would have left. I was so over by then. Um, I was fucking hateful, dude. I didn't want to accept that was actually happening to me. And then, 
you know, I had to kind of close out that chapter and accept it. Like, this is what is happening. And I finally got my retirement date. The med board is over. It's probably uh, May or June. Um, there is an invite for the world record for a skydiving thing. Um, and I went out there and I um, did my training jumps and I got picked up and I got a slot invitee for the, uh, for the world record. It's going to be held in Chicago that year. And it was like, that was the fucking best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm so excited. <sighs> Came back home and, you know, got zapped with the voltage. Kind of reset everything. So at that point when that had happened, I had been through NICO, done four more deployments, been through seven East, came off all the meds except Cymbalta and Adderall. Now I've got the, um, the world record thing coming up. Super excited. Basically leaning in heavy on tribe skates. Um, just doing that all day long, just trying to keep myself sane. Um, I'm in the best shape of my life with, uh, with VHP I'm training every day. And I feel like a million bucks. Like I'm finally starting to come out of it, at least on the surface. Um, things were still rocky with the family. I was still, um, any moment I could to separate myself. I did. I mean, I do it now. Um, just out of habit, but I'd be up at 5 a.m. every morning. There's no reason. I don't answer to anybody. And I'd go sand skateboards out in a fucking empty parking lot at 5 a.m. Just to be by myself. I didn't want anybody there with me. I just... I didn't know what I was going to do, man. But I knew it wasn't anything positive. Yeah. You know? Um, All right, let's move into... Let's move into Father's Day. 2019? Yep. So... I started to tribe skates, um, started doing fracture burning. We were laying graphics, doing normal stuff, and fracture burning was kind of introduced to me. So you take a microwave transformer, you pull it out, and you hook it up to jumper cables, and run a lead out to 110. There's no real safety measure. Um, there wasn't on that machine. So I ran an extension cord out of my house to an octopus outlet, take said machine, plug into said octopus outlet, and then hit the button. <laughs> Hit the button, unplug it. Now there's no power going to it. The unit's good. I've been doing it for months. Burned hundreds of boards at this point. Um, I've got my got my chi down. I've got my got my whole system down, and it's therapeutic because it's fucking dangerous. Like you got to be you got to be locked on. So I'm in super good shape. Um, it's Father's Day. I am burning paddles for um, an EOD unit. It's about to retire, so they're giveaway paddles. I fracture burn them now, and they do a bunch of cool stuff with them. Um, and a buddy calls me and he's like, Hey, I've got a couple more. Can I drop them off? And I've been out there since 6am, like send it fast forward. I burned, uh, probably 10 boards that morning and, um, he shows up and they're not sanded. They've got lacquer all over them. I've still got a bunch of more boards I got to do. And you have to sand off every ounce of that lacquer or it won't conduct. It just won't do it. You got to spray an electrolyte solution on it, hit it with the voltage. So he is, um, I'm fracture burning boards. I stop, I take a break. He's plugged into the octopus outlet with a sander, sanding him down. In the confusion, um, the sander gets unplugged. My machine gets plugged and the switch gets turned on. Shit. So I've got um, saw horses set up. I'm sanding down boards um, with a bristle brush, knocking all, the, knocking all the ash off. I'm spraying it down with a hose. So the whole backyard is covered in water. I'm in a, I'm in a tank top and board shorts, no shoes on, um, doing my thing. <laughs> Remember it like it was yesterday. We're in front of my bay window, and it's probably from here to there. I mean, it's close. We're standing essentially on the back porch. Both my kids are there. They're watching the iPad. They're watching cartoons, eating breakfast. It's probably 8 a.m. And uh, the old lady knocks on the window. She gives me one of these, like, it's fucking Father's Day. Let's go. I'm trying to go have a family breakfast and do the whole thing. I'm like, last burn last burn and I was like all right man let's knock out this last one and I grabbed those leads and I readjusted my hands and if you're true north that's where he was I was about in this fashion and when I grabbed those leads it snapped me and spun me towards him and every muscle in my body contracted and I can remember my head fighting the urge it wanted to slam back and touch my own spine and I remember fighting it as hard as I could I can remember my teeth heating up um, and it felt like there was a copper spool. I could taste copper in the roof of my mouth fucking spinning. 
Um, we made eye contact. I remember him screaming, fuck, fuck. Oh, no, 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 fuck. And the contraction got so fucking hard. I ended up taking a step back at some point and I landed in a, a puddle of water. But when I did that, I heard a loud pop. And it was my collarbone shattering. And if you listen to Patsy, I leveled out in the air and I shot across the yard, still holding on to these things. Holy shit. I remember hitting the ground and skipping and having this thing. Um, it felt like my entire body was um, being burned alive. It, um, it was intense and it was static, but it was static you could, you could feel. Um, like the static on a TV, like everything went to that and it was um, the static sound was inside of your fucking brain. Just, and he unplugged me. And everything went black. And I don't know how long I was out for. I don't remember. Um, but I remember opening my eyes and he was in my face. And I remember exhaling and smoke coming out. I remember looking down at my hands and I had a burn through my palm. I had one coming out of my finger. Uh, shot came out of my head. Some arc spots out of my thigh. I had one come out next to my ass. Um, and I remember laying there. And he looked at me and he goes, do you know where you are? I said, on the ground? And he said, are you okay? And he said, no. I'm not okay. I was like, my collarbone's broken and my left shoulder's out of socket for sure. And uh, he kind of rocked me up for it and I had a big mouth of Copenhagen in and I bit through my tongue. So you can imagine what that feels like. I just kind of opened my mouth and just let this shit pour out of me. It was just a steady pool of blood. Um, I didn't know how bad it was, but I knew it was bad. <sighs> my wife's freaking the fuck out. The kids are freaking the fuck out. He's freaking the fuck out. Rightfully so. Um, I told him, I, I, uh, I do pretty good at keeping my composure in situations like that. And I was like, we're good. I looked at Patsy and I was like, I'm driving myself to the hospital. I'll go get checked out, go eat breakfast. I'm not ruining Father's Day. And that was the stupidest thing that's ever left my mouth. <laughs> You're going to drive yourself to the hospital now after this? And I remember I stood up. They were trying to find me shoes, um, trying to find a hat and trying to find my wallet. I live maybe two miles from a, like a level three trauma center. Um, and he is going to drive me there. My wife is going to call her mother to come over and watch my kids. And they're going to meet me there. They've already called Cole. They've called everybody in the shop, um, to let everybody know what's happened. I stood up and I said, all right, I'm walking to the truck. And I turned and I got to the gate and it's probably maybe 40 feet to my truck. And I took a step and everything went Took another step. And it reminded me, in the moment I thought about it, you remember Kill Bill? Mm. You remember the five finger death punch? Yeah. Take five steps on the fifth one, you die? Exactly like that. I got the four and I was fucking right here. I was a fucking cyclops, I couldn't see shit. And I was scared to fucking death. I could feel my heart rate slowing down, like I could feel it. I mean, you think it'd be blowing through my chest. It wasn't. I could feel it. Um, and I didn't feel right. I felt very strange. And I took one more step and everything went jet black. It's fucking totally blind. And I'm just on the side of my house. I can't feel anything. I can't put my arms out because everything is broken. So I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that someone's going to come save me. And I can't see a fucking thing. Nothing. And I start to breathe. I start to hyperventilate. Try to flood myself with oxygen. Um... And I forced it. I opened my eyes as wide as I could and I started to deep breathe until light started to come back in. And I felt a hand on my shoulder, it was him, and he guided me to the truck. And by the time I got there, my vision had came back, but it wasn't normal vision. It was like superhuman vision. It was the brightest colors I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, it was like I could see like Superman. I saw everything, I felt everything. Um, I've never been so in tune with my body ever. I could feel, I could feel everything. We got in the truck and we drove to the hospital and we hit every pothole on the way. So my collarbones in like 30 pieces, just kind of gravel, just moving around. My scapula is blown out. And um, every bump we hit, it felt like a shard was gonna go into my lung. Um, I didn't know how bad it was at the time, but I had a pretty good fucking idea. Um, and we walked back there. 
walked in, told him exactly what had happened. We don't know the voltage. I don't know the ampage. I don't know anything except that everything I've ever read is no one survives this shit. Um, so I should have been dead. They brought me back on the table. They stripped me down. They're going through everything. Um, they shoot the x-rays. They see the collarbone shattered. They see the scapula. They see everything else. And this doctor comes back. Um, and he tells me, he's like, hey, man, what do you do? I told him. He's like, here's the issue, is with electrocution in injuries, your body starts to produce some kind of enzyme. Like, I'll fuck up the name, so I'm not going to try. But he goes, if that number hits, we'll call it 10. If it hits 10, your whole body is going to turn into essentially like rhabdo. Muscles are going to liquefy, and I have to start chopping shit out of you. I'm a lot bigger then than I was now, or than I am now. And he goes, I got to start cutting out big things, dude. He's like, pecs got to go, lats got to go, glutes, thighs, hamstrings. We got to cut it out of you because if not, it turns to mush, it turns septic and you'll fucking die. He's like, so when this thing goes, we got to go. So I'm imagining now I'm laying in a hospital bed and this dude's going to walk around the corner with a fucking piece of paper and start cutting pieces off of me. So it's just your tissue, it's dead tissue that's rotting. Yeah. Essentially like, becomes um, toxic. There's so much trauma all the way through your body produces natural enzyme that basically turns shit septic. And he's like, that's what happens with rhabdo, like muscles liquefy or whatever. Um, and he was concerned about it. And um, they did an ambulance ride all the way up to the burn unit, put me in there, ran every test they could, all the x-rays, you know, stayed there for a couple of days. And that dude came back in and he goes, I don't know what the fuck is going on with you. He's like, everybody on earth produces this enzyme. Everybody. You know, if at 10, we've got to start cutting shit out. Everybody sets at a five. He goes, not only are you not at a five, he goes, I can't find a trace of it in your whole fucking body. He goes, it's a medical fucking mystery. Why you're alive, I don't know. Um, there were a bunch of theories about because I was holding on to both leads, um, kind of connected a circuit, my muscles just contracted until I blew shit out. And if he wouldn't have unplugged me, I just would have stayed like that and cooked. You know, another second longer. They were talking about, uh, it's kind of like doing a, um, a defib on somebody. He's like, we don't know what your heart was doing. If he would have unplugged it, you know, 0.25 seconds pre or post, maybe you would have flatlined and died. We don't know. He's like, because no one survives it, so we can't ever get test data for it. Hmm. So I remember laying in the hospital. Um, this is right after it happened, and I was supposed to work a jump course the following day. This happened on a Sunday. I'm supposed to work on Monday. And I remember calling the, uh, the people I was working for um, at Skydive Suffolk. And uh, I was crying. I was like, I am so sorry. Like, I can't believe I did this to you. It's like, I I'm, I'm going to be there. I'll be there tomorrow at 07. I was like, I just don't think I'll be able to jump. And that fucking doctor looked over me. And he's like, you ain't going any fucking way. Just like that. <laughs> Patsy jumped my ass. And I was like, Patsy, like, I'm just going to go down there. I'm in slings. I'm not doing any of this shit. And he's like, you could fucking die. Just like that. Hand the phone over. Patsy talked to her and basically like, he, he's not going to make this trip. Um, and I didn't want to hear that. And then I instantly asked him, like, well, I've got the world record coming up in four weeks. And he looked at me and he's like, your days are done, dude. You're not fucking jumping. He's like, you're going to need major, major reconstructive surgery. And I had just went through it. Like I had just gotten done. Yeah. Like I just went through a year long rehab process. Like again, what the fuck, man? Like uh, you talking about driving dude in a hole. Like not again, man, not a fucking again. Um, and the things you don't think about, like putting on socks. I couldn't put on fucking socks. I couldn't wipe my own ass. I couldn't bathe myself. I couldn't do shit. I could do nothing. I was worthless for months. I mean, I've got two plates and 27 screws from here to here. Like, it's over. The, my, my collarbone doesn't hinge on my sternum right. Like, this scapula thing, when that thing blew out, that was an injury that I never respected before. You hear about people breaking shoulder blades and scapulas. You're like, ah, that's a terrible injury. It's terrible. When it blew out of my hand, it kind of fused my hand. So when people would shake it, it blew a hole through and hit the nerve and hit the nerve bundle and hit the tendon. So anytime you would move my thumb, it felt like you were ripping my thumb off. I couldn't, I couldn't draw a pistol. Holding a carbine was miserable. Um, and I had to basically just deal with that. 
And you were going to contract as well when you retired, correct? Yeah, I was supposed to go in September, December. So that was out the window now. Oh, there's no way. Yeah, with the rehab it took, there's no way. Just had to keep pushing that date back further and further. Try to lean in heavy on tribe skates, but now I'm hurt. Now what do I do? Like, now what do I do? Went back at it. 6 a.m., five days later, and I finished fraction burning all those fucking skateboards, what I did. Yeah. My wife woke up, and you have never seen her look like that. Dude, she stood on that she stood on that back porch and looked at me, and if looks could kill, I'd be fucking dead. Called me everything she could. Selfish motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. And she was right. Um, but I told her, I was like, it was, it's like skydiving. You have a cutaway. You have to get back on the next load and go back up. You're going to build it up too much in your head. And I was like, it's a freak accident. I'm lucky enough to be alive. And if I don't do it right now, it's like, this thing will define me right now. I was like, this isn't who I am. I can't let this fucking thing beat me. I have to do it again. And I think she understood. And we obviously have a different system now and it's very controlled now. Um, I don't let anybody do it around me. <laughs> we, uh, we cut that out of it. But that rehab coming back, um, the very next day we started. I yeah. called Vernon Griffith, my trainer, and we started the very next day with a two pound dumbbell. Doing the whole thing over again. And it was, it was miserable. Damn. And you started uh, GBRS group. So we had, here. yeah, we had tribe skates. And then, um, yeah, in 2019, right after that, we started uh, GBRS. So that happened in, I retired in August. Um, that happened in, when's Father's Day? July, June. In June July. 19th. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, we started that in September, GBRS. It's like full steam ahead. We got to go. It's focused on rehab every day. Hired a full-time trainer and uh, just focused on rehab, trying to get back. <sighs> it's not really what happened. I, uh, I separated myself from everything. I, um, I used the skateboard shit as a, as a coping mechanism. It was really just an excuse. I, uh, I, had to, I had to replace my love for the teams, my love for jumping, and my love for being away from my family. I had to give myself something else. And um, it was the worst thing I ever fucking did, man. I, um, I let my ego get the best of me and started cheating on the old lady and just push them away. I just did. I, um, I ran multiple affairs for the better part of two years, um, all the way through. And, uh, I pushed out my fucking whole family, man. I, um, I you had no were able to reason. keep that shit together for two years. You ran two businesses, you're retiring, you have a family with two kids and you're doing multiple affairs. And the thing that disgusts me the most about it is because I love the team so much. I put Patsy on a fucking pedestal because of who she was, what she'd already been through. Um, and, you know, we pride ourselves on loyalty. And that's the biggest loyalty breach on fucking earth. Um, I had no justification for it. She's badass, dude. Like, I don't deserve her. I mean... She's hot as shit too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I had no excuse. She's perfect. I just didn't want it. I wanted to consume myself with toxic people and that's exactly what I did. Um, I hid it for a while and then I couldn't hide it anymore. I just, I couldn't. It, I was gonna fucking kill myself. Um, I was back on pain pills. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I had all my stuff from, um, from before, I was back on Tramadol, back on Percocet, from the electrocution, and um, I went back on status quo. I was like, well, I don't do anything half-assed. I'm going to do it. I'm going the whole way. Mm. And I, basically everything I did before, I just kept doing again. I just subbed out the teams for businesses and affairs, and I went. Well, then you kind of came into contact. Well, I mean, I know you guys knew each other before, but... Patsy made a call to Amber Capone. What? What? So we heard about it. We heard what Marcus and Amber were doing. And uh, what was the final straw? I mean, it sounded like it was like the last call in desperation there. So Marcus and Amber did um, 
I guess you'd call it a commercial. It was kind of like their story, and we knew their story. Like, we know them the entire time, so we knew everything they had been through. I mean, broad brush, I mean, we know. And uh, they made this they made this trailer, I guess. And uh, I was gone on a trip, and she sent it to me. And uh, I was laying in bed at a fucking Marriott, and I watched that thing, and I bawled my eyes out um, uncontrollably. Because I knew how bad I had taken. I knew how far I had went. And I didn't know how to fix it. I didn't think it was able to be fixed. I didn't. And uh, she sent it to me. And she went, if you love me, you'll go. It's kind of a weird thing for a wife to ask your husband to go to Mexico and do drugs. Try to fix yourself. And I went, I'll go. I'll go. Um, it didn't matter, though. I, uh, I wasn't hopeful. Um, once she said she wanted me to go, it was like a beacon of light. It let in some hope. She does give a shit. She does want me better. Like, she wants me back. She's willing to work this out. She's willing to accept me. Um, she didn't know everything that was going on. She didn't. Um, she might have had an assumption, but she didn't know. She definitely didn't know the, the severity of the affairs. She didn't. So by the time we get there, now we're in business with uh, three other team guys. And now we're all going to go. We're all going to go together. We're all going to heal together because we've all been through some serious shit. And we're going to go process this entire thing together in one fell swoop. What I didn't do, um, what I didn't do was be honest to the people around me on what I was going through. I didn't tell them everything I had going on. Um, the shit overseas, the, the disappointments on retirement, the transition life, the affairs, um, you know, drama with my, drama with my family, just everything. I didn't let them know how bad it was. Um, and I had a fucking serious secret. I had one that I couldn't come back from. There's no way. It's a, it's my defining moment and that'll be the last thing that anyone ever hears about me is how bad I fucked this up and there's no way to fix it. So it's every day we got closer and closer to Mexico. I fell more and more in love with my wife and kids every fucking day. I still wasn't homesick. I still wanted to be gone, but I would see it and it made me regret everything I had done for the last two years. I just, every time I saw him, it's just the guilt. It, um, uh, it hung around me. It hung around my fucking neck, man. And, uh, You want to go through the whole story? You yeah. Want to take it all the way? Yeah. So we uh, we link up with Marcus and Amber, and uh, we fly out there, and uh, we put in some serious fucking work, man. That, uh, that medicine, that entire experience is nothing on this universe. It can't be quantified. You, you can't do an experience and pass it off and tell somebody your story. and It, it sounds too bizarre. It just does divine intervention and everything else. Uh, you believe in aliens after that shit. Like it, it doesn't make sense. Um, the word cosmic comes up a lot when people do it. Like you feel like you're one with the universe. It's weird. Um, you become interconnected to everything and you understand everything you've ever done. And it is at the forefront of your mind when you wake up the next day. It is so there. how does it happen then? I mean, is it immediate? Or no. you feel it the next day? or No, I mean, you process that thing for weeks. Um, it's in your system for a long time. At least it felt like. But, you know, you go down there, you do a ceremony, you give out your intentions, and I haven't told anybody my intentions. I haven't told anybody what I'm trying to deal with. None of them. Um, they have no idea. They assume that we're um, dealing with some PTSD shit and some, uh, some stress, some operator syndrome, maybe some other stuff. And... uh we did Ibogaine, had a very profound experience, and I woke up the next morning for the first time in a decade. I would have cut off a fucking arm to teleport home. I've never wanted to be home that bad in my entire life. Um, and I knew it was all for nothing. I knew it didn't matter. There's no going home for me. Um, just the thoughts that go through your mind when you know you fucked up so bad, you can't come back from it. What do you say? 
Like how do you enjoy that experience? How do you process the information knowing you'll never get to share it with another human being? Because at the end of this road, I got to fucking kill myself. And that's what it was. Um, that's a hard thing to wrap your head around. Like, I'm so selfish. I'm a, I'm such a fucking coward that instead of face the music, this is what's going to happen. We process the entire day. We wake up the next morning. We do a ceremony. We, um, we all come together and we're working through trauma together. It's a bunch of team guys in the same room, a bunch of them we know, a couple of them we don't know. And the common theme, um, because I'll just say it now, after I began, I'll just say it. I looked at all of them, um, and they were pouring out some, some serious shit, some serious childhood traumas and dumping them on the table for everyone to see. And I called them all out. Fuck you guys. I've been sitting here for 16 fucking years alone, thinking I'm the only fucking dude. You've been my best friend my entire time. You've never told me that. Why'd you let me do this alone? Why? <laughs> like how many fucking times I almost blew my head off in a fucking guest room? Why? Why didn't you fucking tell me, man? It's fucking rough, dude. It, uh, and you see the collective, everyone, everyone in the fucking room, the exact same way dudes have been in 25 years. Had a fucking 30 year master chief in there. Same fucking thing. I'm like, why? Why the fuck didn't you say it? I want a fucking answer. Tell me. I didn't have one. Like, I wasn't ready. You better fucking get ready. Like, if any of you dudes go back home and you don't jump on the first building and scream from the fucking rooftops, this shit will save you, then fuck you. Don't be a senior man with a secret, not with this shit. I would have been so much better off if people would have just said it. Like, this happened and this is how I'm feeling. It's okay to not be okay. This shit is fucking... This is life, man. Like, as bad as we want to feel like we're universal soldiers and fucking Dolph Lundgren and Jean-Claude, we're not. Like, we're grown-ass men that have kids that call us Papa. You got to stay up late and do homework. We got to drop kids off on school buses. And you got to get on a fucking airplane and fly away and never see them again. You got to be okay with that. Um, and it's a hard thing to do, especially when you do it solo. When you never say it. Not that it's not there. It's there. It's on the forefront of everybody's mind. And you're just not saying it. So we had a beautiful, um, beautiful couple hours. We processed a lot of shit. Had a nice family dinner. And we're just constantly just on topic, talking about just everything. Fuck, man, I felt so relieved to be able to just say it. But I hadn't said it yet. Yeah. Hadn't said a fucking thing yet. We wake up the next morning and we're going to do 5-MEO um, DMT. We sent up a couple guys and they are saving me last. Um, I, I think maybe they thought I was going to have a, a conniption. Um, because everybody knew I was really working through some shit and they just didn't know how bad it was. Um, and I laid back. Um, you know, we smoked a five, laid back, and I've never cried like that in my whole fucking life. Every ounce of pain I have caused my wife, I've caused my kids, and anyone else I felt right then. And I did it over and over. I was chasing the release. All this negative shit had filled up and it was coming out of my mouth and I couldn't stop it. Um, I just, I needed to purge all of this hate that I had inside me. And it was really just hatred for myself. It, um, they told you, you'll know when you're done. You'll wake up, and it could be on the, the first dose, it could be on the fifth dose, it doesn't matter, you'll know when you're done. And I rolled over and I was done. Like, I was at complete peace with everything. Like, I've never felt so alive. I've never felt so connected to this earth. I've never wanted to go strap on body armor and deploy more in my entire fucking life. I felt like I had a superpower. We all did, and we all talked about it. I feel like I know something that no one else on this earth knows. It's like you do. It's like you have a secret no one else knows. Like this medicine will save everybody. Fuck, I wish I could just give it to everybody right now and fix everybody. It's not how it works. Um, and we're still processing all this information. So we've done that. We do our final ceremony and we're flying home the next day. They've, uh, we've been in River City. There's no phones. Uh, there's no email. There's no nothing. We had to write a letter home. Um, 
and they basically gave us a blanket statement. They were like, hey, send this text out to your significant other, your, everybody's married, so send it out to your wife. It says, hey, I'd love to, um, I'm through with the ceremony. I can't wait to see you, and I can't wait to tell you about everything that I've experienced. Blanket statement. And I knew Patsy was itching um, to hear from me. I mean, we haven't heard from days. And you go River City on Friday, and now it's on Monday at like noon. So we're in San Diego. We're all at an Airbnb waiting for our flights. And uh, like, okay. Because, you know, we're all business partners. All the wives are interconnected. So, like, you can't text your wife before I text mine. Yeah. Right? So, like, all right, ready? Three, two. We all send it. All their phones go off. Not mine. She's probably at the gym. I hit her, hit her location. She's at the house. Okay. Send her another text. Hey, are you available for a call? I call the house. They don't answer. Click back on location. She's not sharing her location with me anymore. Hmm. That's strange. Call her cell phone. Straight to voicemail the fuck like maybe the kids are on the phone maybe they're just swiping up just, they're watching youtube whatever so i let it go um three or four hours go by nothing and i know the other wives have talked to them they're not saying anything to me they haven't heard anything and they're tight like all the they're we're tight we get a drive to the airport we get to the airport and i'm on uh i'm on pins and needles man i can't even fucking breathe because i have the secret and I don't know how it's going to get out. And now I'm starting to question. Like, does she know? <sighs> she find out at the affairs. Like, what the fuck is going on? We get into the airport. Um, we stop in a layover in Atlanta. And I power on my phone. And there's a notification that pops up that says, um, password's been changed to my email. Like, hmm. That's weird. And then I go to log on to, I had a ghost uh, Instagram account. Um, that I've run all these affairs on. And she had hacked into that. She changed the password and opened it up. And she opened it up on Friday when we went River City. And she had all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and all day Monday to read through everything I had said and done the last two years. Everything. And you're a team guy, so you know exactly what those were. And she read it all. And at the very end of it, um, she found out that one of the one of the people I was having an affair with was pregnant. Oh fuck! So I don't know any of this. I just know that now she's in there, and now I'm panic at the disco, and now I'm telling them, "Oh my god!" Like she's hacked into my Instagram account. Like she knows. I'm like, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. We land in Virginia Beach, we drive back to the shop. All the wives are there, except mine. <sighs> Take a big breath and I walk upstairs in my office and every fucking thing I owned is in cardboard boxes sitting in my office. Everything. And there's just printouts of all these text messages that I'd been sending out. Screenshots of pictures and all kinds of shit. There's, uh, there's everything in there. And I knew. You know, coming back from that one. There's Fuck, no coming man. back from that one. It's heavy, man. Um, and I, uh, I saw the other wives give everybody a hug, and I, uh, I looked up at Cole, kissed him on the cheek, told him I loved him, and uh, said I'd call him in a little bit. And I had no intention of calling him in a little bit. I uh, jumped in my truck and I drove straight out to uh, to Sandbridge, right out by the ocean. I backed my truck up right next to uh, right next to the command gate, and I sat there in my truck, and I contemplated everything I had done, my entire fucking life, from the fallout with my parents to the, you know, having kids and the affairs and everything in between, actions overseas, everything I had ever done, it was so crystal clear. It was like I had superhuman memory for the first time. I remembered everything, but it wasn't anything positive. It was just all the terrible shit I had done. It was in the forefront of my mind, and I didn't have the courage to call Patsy. I didn't. Um, thinking about um, thinking about making that phone call and her not answering, but her just dismissing me, I couldn't do it. Um, all I wanted to do was see my kids. 
That was it. Just let me see my two girls. Just let me give me one fucking glimpse of them. And I'll be out of your hair. Just let me say goodbye to them. And I'm, uh, I'm parked over there and she called me out of the fucking blue, just called me and she was tracking me. Um, Cole had actually followed me. So he knew where I was going. She tracked my location, knew exactly what I was going to do. And she called me and she's like, Hey, um, I need to see you. I'm going to see you fucking face to face right now. Is that okay? Had you made your mind up how you were going to do it? Yep. I shoot myself right in the front seat of that truck. Made a video, the kids, whole thing, selfie video. That's it. Fuck, man. So she found you. She fucking drove up, parked right next to me. Um, she got out of that car like she had a thousand times, and I was sitting on the tailgate. And uh, she walked over to me. I'm sitting on the tailgate and she walked right in between my legs and pulled my glasses off my fucking face. And she cried. Um, I've never seen a woman cry like that. <laughs> Fuck. <sighs> Bought her fucking eyes out. So did I. I mean, uh, one of those uncontrollable ones with shit just coming out of your face. And, um, uh, I was trying to tell her how sorry I was, how much I regretted everything. And um, she looked at me right in the fucking eyes and she knew that I was back. It's the weirdest thing. You can't explain it. Um, but she looked at me and my eyes were clear for the first time. I was off all pain meds. When I woke up from Ibogaine, never had another painkiller. No Cymbalta, no Adderall, no Copenhagen, no nothing. No affairs, nothing. Um, since then, but she saw it. She saw that I was completely sober for the first time ever. And she looked me right in the fucking eyes and she said, are you willing to try to work this out? I said, absolutely. And she was like, I don't know if that means we're married, but she's like, I can't have you kill yourself. She's like, these fucking kids need you too much. The shop needs you. Don't do this to these families. Like you and me can, you and me can figure out a common ground. And that's all I wanted. I knew we'd never stay married. I don't fucking deserve her. I just didn't want to lose it all. I didn't want her to, I didn't want to end it like that. And we went back, we had a, a super hard conversation. Um, and she asked me, she's like, I want to know everything right now. And I fucking told her everything. I fell on my sword and for the first time in my life, I didn't, I didn't filter a fucking thing. I sent it the whole way. I told her every ounce of it, every detail how long it had been going on, why it had been going on, and what I'm going to do now. Um, and I told her, I was like, I don't want, I don't want you to stay with me. I don't want you to stay married to me. I just want, I want the opportunity to make it up to you. Just give me one fucking chance to prove to you every day that I'm fucking sorry. Like, I don't need to be forgiven. Just give me the opportunity to make it okay. And every day I wake up with that on the forefront of my mind. Like, I'm going to show you today how committed I am. I'll show you today how far I'm willing to go for the family. And that's the, that's the goal every day. And ever since that fucking day, since I landed in Virginia Beach, we have never been better. It's, um, fuck, it's hard to say, man, but we have never been better. My kids have never, <laughs> my kids have never loved me more. It's weird. Um, my oldest called me DJ until I retired. All of them. Yeah. And now it's like, that's my why now. It is. Like, I'm the luckiest fucking dude I know. I am, and I don't deserve to be. I don't deserve, uh, I don't deserve to have her. I don't deserve to have those kids, but I'll fucking take it. Um, she stuck with it through all that shit. She fucking did, man. She stuck through with all of that. Everything she's fucking been through. All that shit I put her through. Not the affairs. Like that life in the teams with me was fucking rough, man. Um, I mean, she used to look forward to me being gone. All I cared about was that fucking place. 
Yeah. I did. I just, I cared about the teams. I just, I wanted to do that and I didn't want any distractions. And then I let it consume me. And then I needed to find, I needed to find something else. Skydiving, I couldn't do that anymore. Now what? Now we're doing this. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. It's the worst thing I've ever done. And it's the only thing in my life that I wish I could take back. The rest of that shit I'll take. The scars I'll take. The bad memories I'll take. The look on her face. That's what keeps me up at night. Just the breach of loyalty. She trusted me. Everybody did. They trusted me to, to do her right. And I fucking didn't. I let my ego take control. It fucking sucks. Some fucking heavy shit, man. Yeah, that is some uh, real heavy shit. That's an amazing woman. <laughs> no shit. If we think back to not going to Mexico, just imagine if that happens on a Tuesday. She finds out. There's no Mexico. Yeah. I'm the same way that I was before. I wouldn't be here. I was too fucking suicidal. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was hinging on it. Like, I was, man. I was just, I was itching for a reason. And that was my reason. Without her, man, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I was actually going to have her call in, but, uh, things didn't go as planned. But well, we're wrapping this up. But I got to tell you, man, you've got to be one of the most resilient people I've ever fucking met that is uh been through a lot of shit it's a daily stroke it is man like that fucking road ain't easy and I'll tell you what after I um after the whole thing kind of came out you know it spread through the community like fucking wildfire I was surprised how many other people it happened to a shit ton of people a bunch of people that I knew I had no fucking idea. Like, I mean, cheating's a, it's a common theme in the military. I mean, it just is. Gone mm -hmm. on the road a lot, it's a common thing. Um, I feel like she should have gotten an exemption. I feel like I owed that to her. You've been through enough. You didn't deserve some fucking typical team guy piece of shit cheating on you. You didn't. She's fucking perfect. And I took her for granted. It's fucking terrible. Every day I wake up, I'm going to prove to you one more time. That's a struggle. She said that when uh, when I talked to her, that every day, and that's the first thing you say when you guys wake up. Yep. Yeah. It's the truth. I mean, she keeps me accountable. And that's what I needed. I needed someone to hold me accountable. It's like since that's happened... I mean, we turned over, um, the gold star thing started right after that. And it's like, <laughs> every day I'm dealing with that. And I'm also dealing with everything else that goes along with it. So, I mean, me and her, we're thick as thieves now. I mean, we have to be. Like, put our backs against the wall, and it's like, just you and me. At the end of the day, it's just this. The rest of it's just noise. It doesn't matter. Good for you. Like the big thing about Mexico, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is this family. Things I can control, things I can reach out and grab and pull in. Everything else is it's fake. Social media, it's not real. People pretending like they're happy and they're fucking not. And I see it now. I know exactly who that guy is. I know exactly the pain he's in. I know the pain that she's in. Doesn't have to be that way. If we just open up and we just say it, we can save people. Like I'm sick of people killing themselves over what feels like a, a mountain of time. It's not. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. No. I think we were just uh, more open about it. Just say it. We'd be a lot better off. If you have one piece of advice for guys coming out now because we're hitting... 20 years, you know, what would it be? Guys transitioning? Yep. It's going to be a lot harder than you think it is. 
I see a lot of guys who do a failed transition now because they try to do it alone. You didn't do anything in the military alone. Nothing. You didn't, you didn't write your own eval. You didn't do anything. You didn't do your own med checkups. You didn't. You had a team supporting you the entire way through. Guys try to get out and they try to reinvent themselves into something brand new with no experience. And they try to do it as a singleton. And when it doesn't fail, it's a damn good point. They hit rock bottom. Like, why? Like, I get it. You want to go to Goldman Sachs. That's awesome. You're the only Navy SEAL in that fucking place. Who are you going to talk to? Like, who are you going to have a conversation with? When you're having a bad day, a fucking bad day, what are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Everybody else is busy. Like, you have to have people to check in with. I think that's, I mean, that was the thing that saved us. After Mexico, we just say it. Like, there was open dialogue in that place now. All the Gold Star kids that are in there, we just say it. Like, we're not, ha we're not having this shit anymore. We have open forum conversations. Like, you got something on your mind, say it. Say it right fucking now. Don't hold it. Don't let it fester. It won't get better with time. You won't just get over it in five years. You won't. It'll compound, it'll snowball, and it'll consume you. Um, well, I'm glad you're spearheading that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I got one last question. You have kids. After all you've been through, all those deployments, all those injuries, mental, physical, would you want your kid doing that? Yes and no. If they were going to do it with true believers, with the right crowd, that dedicated to the mission, um, and really obsessed with it, absolutely. If it turns into uh, some watered down thing in 15 or 20 years where it becomes like a part time thing, no. In my opinion, that career field, um, special operations in general, cannot be a part-time approach. You can't mass produce that. You need people that will obsess over every detail. The nation deserves it. I have a kid who's lucky enough to be a part of that, then absolutely. But I don't want some watered down bullshit. I don't want that. It's too dangerous to have that. It's like the only way to do it is to do it right. Do it the best of your ability. Um, I know I do it all over again. I do every ounce of it except for the last two years. As far as military, every bit that I hated, every time I was motherfucking somebody, it was all part of the story. I was exactly where I needed to be, doing exactly what I needed to do, and I'd do it all again. Roger that. Well, man, I just want to say it was, it was a real honor interviewing you, and, and uh, fuck. Seriously, yeah. truly, it was an honor. I appreciate it. So, anybody looking to find you, the links are below. And uh, man, I just wish you the best of success and uh, most happiness. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Yeah.